section one of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jeff edward dumas in eldorado arkansas more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs the pied piper newtown or franchville as twas called of old is a sleepy little town as you all may know upon the solent shore sleepy as it is now it was once noisy enough and what made the noise was rats the place was so infested with them as to be scarce worth living in there wasn't a barn or a corn rick a store-room or a cupboard but they ate their way into it not a cheese but they gnawed it hollow not a sugar puncheon but they cleared out why the very mead and beer in the barrels was not safe from them they'd gnaw a hole in the top of the tun and down would go one master rat's tail and when he brought it up round would crowd all the friends and cousins and each would have a suck at the tail had they stopped here it might have been borne but the squeaking and shrieking the hurrying and scurrying so that you could neither hear yourself speak nor get a wink of good honest sleep the live-long night not to mention that mamma must needs sit up and keep watch and ward over baby's cradle or there'd have been a big ugly rat running across the poor little fellow's face and doing who knows what mischief why didn't the good people of the town have cats well they did and there was a fair stand-up fight but in the end the rats were too many and the pussies were regularly driven from the field poison i hear you say why they poisoned so many that it fairly bred a plague rat catchers why there wasn't a rat catcher from john o'groat's house to the land's end that hadn't tried his luck but do what they might cats or poison terrier or traps there seemed to be more rats than ever and every day a fresh rat was cocking his tail or pricking his whiskers the mayor and the town council were at their wits end as they were sitting one day in the town hall racking their poor brains and bewailing their hard fate who should run in but the town beetle please your honour says he here is a very quick fellow come to town i don't rightly know what to make of him show him in said the mayor and in he stepped a queer fellow truly for there wasn't a colour of the rainbow but you might find it in some corner of his dress and he was tall and thin and had keen piercing eyes i'm called the pied piper he began and pray what might you be willing to pay me if i rid you of every single rat in franchville well much as they feared the rats they feared parting with their money more and fain would they have higgled and haggled but the piper was not a man to stand nonsense and the upshot was that fifty pounds were promised him and it meant a lot of money in those old days as soon as not a rat was left to squeak or scurry in franchville out of the hall stepped the piper and as he stepped he laid his pipe to his lips and a shrill keen tune sounded through street and house and as each note pierced the air you might have seen a strange sight for out of every hole the rats came tumbling there were none too old and none too young none too big and none too little to crowd at the piper's heels and with eager feet and upturned noses to patter after him as he paced the streets nor was the piper unmindful of the little toddling ones for every fifty yards he'd stop and give an extra flourish on his pipe just to give them time to catch up with the older and stronger of the band up silver street he went and down gold street and at the end of gold street is the harbor and the broad solent beyond and as he paced along slowly and gravely the townsfolk flocked to door and window and many a blessing they called down upon his head as for getting near him there were too many rats and now that he was at the water's edge he stepped into a boat and not a rat as he shoved off into deep water piping shrilly all the while but followed him plashing paddling and wagging their tails with delight on and on he played and played until the tide went down and each master rat sank deeper and deeper in the slimy ooze of the harbor until every mother's son of them was dead 
and smothered. The tide rose again, and the piper stepped on shore. But never a rat followed. You might fancy the townsfolk had been throwing up their caps and hurrahing, and stopping up rat holes and setting the church bells a ringing. But when the piper stepped ashore, and not so much as a single squeak was to be heard, the mayor and the council, and the townsfolk generally, began to hum and to ha and to shake their heads, for the town money chest had been sadly emptied of late, and where was the fifty pounds to come from? Such an easy job, too! Just getting into a boat and playing a pipe? Why, the mayor himself could have done that if only he had thought of it. So he hummed and hawed, and at last, Come, my good man, said he, you see what poor folk we are. How can we manage to pay you fifty pounds? Will you not take twenty? When all is said and done, twill be good pay for all the trouble you've taken. Fifty pounds was what I bargained for, said the piper shortly. And if I were you, I'd pay it quickly, for I can pipe many kinds of tunes, as folk sometimes find to their cost. Would you threaten us, you strolling vagabond? shrieked the mayor, and at the same time he winked to the council. The rats are all dead and drowned, muttered he, and so, You may do your best, my good man. And with that he turned short upon his heel. Very well, said the piper, and he smiled a quiet smile. With that he laid his pipe to his lips afresh, but now there came forth no shrill notes, as it were, of scraping and gnawing, and squeaking and scurrying, but the tune was joyous and resonant, full of happy laughter and merry play. And as he paced down the street, the elders mocked. But from schoolroom and playroom, from nursery and workshop, not a child but ran out with eager glee and shout following gaily at the piper's call dancing laughing joining hands and tripping feet the bright throng moved along up gold street and down silver street and beyond silver street lay the cool green forest full of old oaks and wide-spreading beeches in and out among the oak trees you might catch glimpses of the piper's many-coloured coat you might hear the laughter of the children break and fade and die away as deeper and deeper into the lone green wood the stranger went and the children followed all the while the elders watched and waited they mocked no longer now and watch and wait as they might never did they set their eyes again upon the piper in his party-coloured coat Never were their hearts gladdened by the song and dance of the children issuing forth from amongst the ancient oaks of the forest. End of the Pied Piper Section 2 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Jäger. Lunchbreaking.blogspot.com More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs Here after this. Once upon a time there was a farmer called Jan, and he lived all alone by himself in a little farmhouse. By and by he thought that he would like to have a wife to keep it all waiting for him. So he went a courting a fine maid, and he said to her, Will you marry me? That I will, to be sure, said she. So they went to church and were wed. After the wedding was over, she got up on his horse behind him, and he brought her home. As they lived as happy as the day was long. One day Jan said to his wife, Wife! Can you milky? Oh, yes, Jan, I can milky. Mother used to milky when I lived home. So he went to market and bought her ten red cows. All went well till one day when she had driven them to the pond to drink. She thought they did not drink fast enough. So she drove them right into the pond to make them drink faster, and they were all drowned. When Jan came home, she up and told him what she had done, and he said, Oh, well, there, never mind, my dear, better luck next time. 
So they went on for a bit, and then one day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you serve pigs? Oh, yes, Jan, I can serve pigs. Mother used to serve pigs when I lived home. So Jan went to market and bought her some pigs. All went well till one day, when she had put their food into the trough, she thought they did not eat fast enough, and she pushed their heads into the trough to make them eat faster, and they were all choked. When Jan came home, she up and told him what she had done, and he said, Oh, well, there, never mind, my dear, better luck next time. So they went on for a bit, and then one day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you bake it? Oh, yes, Jan, I can bake it. Mother used to bake it when I lived home. So he bought everything for his wife so that she could bake bread. All went well for a bit, till one day she thought she would bake white bread for a treat for Jan. So she carried her meal to the top of a high hill and let the wind blow on it, for she thought to herself that the wind would blow all, all the bran. But the wind blew away meal and bran and all, so there was an end of it. When Jan came home, she up and told him what she had done, and he said, Oh, well, there, never mind, my dear, better luck next time. So they went on for a bit, and then one day Jan said to his wife, Wife, can you brew it? Oh, yes, Jan, I can brew it. Mother used to brew it when I lived home. So he bought everything proper for his wife to brew ale with. All went well for a bit, till one day when she had brewed her ale and put it in the barrel, a big black dog came in and looked up in her face. She drove him out of the house, but he stayed outside the door and still looked up in her face, and she got so angry that she pulled out the plug of the barrel, threw it at the dog and said, What does look at me for? I be Jan's wife. Then the dog ran down the road, and she ran after him to chase him right away. When she came back again, she found that the ale had all run out of the barrel, and so there was an end of it. When Jan came home, she up and told him what she had done, and he said, Oh, well, then, never mind, my dear, better luck next time. So they went on for a bit, and then one day she thought to herself, It's time to clean up my house. When she was taking down her big bed, she found a bag of groats on the tester. So when Jan came home, she up and said to him, Jan! What is that bag of groats on the tester for? That is for here after this, my dear. Now, there was a robber outside the window, and he heard what Jan said. Next day, he waited till Jan had gone to market, and then he came and knocked at the door. What do you please to want? said Mally. I am here after this, said the robber. I have come for the bag of groats. Now, the robber was dressed like a fine gentleman. So she thought to herself it was very kind of so fine a man to come for the bag of groats. So she ran upstairs and fetched the bag of groats and gave it to the robber and he went away with it. When Jan came home she said to him, Jan, here after this has been for the bag of groats. What do you mean, wife, said Jan. So she up and told him and he said, Then I am a ruined man, for that money was to pay our rent with. The only thing we can do is to roam the world over till we find a bag of groats. Then Jan took the house door off its hinge. That's all we shall have to lie on, he said. So Jan put the door on his back, and they both set out to look for here after this. Many a long day they went, and in the night Jan used to put the door on the branches of a tree, and they would sleep on it. One night they came to a big hill, and there was a high tree at the foot. So Jan put the door up in it, and they got up in the tree and went to sleep. By and by, Jan's wife heard a noise, and she looked to see what it was. It was an opening of a door in the side of the hill. Out came two gentlemen with a long table, and behind them fine ladies and gentlemen, each carrying a bag, and one of them was here after this, with a bag of groats. They sat round the table and began to think and talk and count up all the money in the bags. So then Jan's wife woke him up and asked what they should do. Now's our time, said Jan, and he pushed the door off the branches, and it fell right in the very middle of the table and frightened the robbers so that they all ran away. Then Jan and his wife got down from the tree, 
took as many money bags as they could carry on the door and went straight home and Jan bought his wife more cows and more pigs and they lived happily ever after end of section two here after this recording by claudia jage lunchbreaking.blogspot.com more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs section three of more english fairy tales the golden ball this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs the golden ball there were two lasses daughters of one mother and as they came from the fair they saw a right bonny young man stand at the house door before them they never saw such a bonny man before he had gold on his cap gold on his finger gold on his neck a red gold watch chain a but he had brass he had a golden ball in each hand he gave a ball to each lass and she was to keep it and if she lost it she was to be hanged one of the lasses twas the youngest lost her ball i'll tell thee how she was by a park paling and she was tossing her ball and it went up and up and up till it went fair over the paling and when she climbed up to look the ball ran along the green grass and it went right forward to the door of the house and the ball went in and she saw it no more so she was taken away to be hanged by the neck till she was dead because she'd lost her ball but she had a sweetheart and he said he would go and get the ball so he went to the park gate but twas shut so he climbed the hedge and when he got to the top of the hedge an old woman rose up out of the dyke before him and said if he wanted to get the ball he must sleep three nights in the house he said he would then he went into the house and looked for the ball but could not find it night came on and he heard boggles move in the courtyard so he looked out of the window and the yard was full of them presently he heard steps coming upstairs he hid behind the door and was as still as a mouse then in came a big giant five times as tall as he and the giant looked round but did not see the lad so he went to the window and bowed to look out and as he bowed on his elbows to see the boggles in the yard the lad stepped out behind him and with one blow of his sword he cut him in twain so that the top part of him fell in the yard and the bottom part stood looking out of the window there was a great cry from the boggles when they saw half the giant come tumbling down to them and they called out there comes half our master give us the other half so the lad said tis no use of thee thou pair of legs standing alone at the window as thou hast no eye to see with so go join thy brother and he cast the lower part of the giant after the top part now when the boggles had gotten all the giant they were quiet next night the lad was at the house again and now a second giant came in at the door and as he came in the lad cut him in twain but the legs walked on to the chimney and went up them go get thee after thy legs said the lad to the head and he cast the head up the chimney too the third night the lad got into bed and he heard the boggles striving under the bed and they had the ball there and they were casting it to and fro now one of them has his leg thrust out from under the bed so the lad brings his sword down and cuts it off then another thrusts his arm out at other side of the bed the lad cuts that off so at last he had maimed them all and they all went crying and wailing off and forgot the ball but he took it from under the bed and went to see his true love now the lass was taken to york to be hanged she was brought out on the scaffold and the hangman said now lass thou must hang by the neck till thou beest dead but she cried out stop stop i think i see my mother coming oh mother has brought my golden ball and come to set me free 
i have neither brought thy golden ball nor come to set thee free but i have come to see thee hung upon this gallows tree then the hangman said now lass say thy prayers for thou must die but she said stop stop i think i see my father coming o father hast brought my golden ball and come to set me free i have neither brought thy golden ball nor come to set thee free but i have come to see thee hung upon this gallows tree then the hangman said hast thee done thy prayers now lass put thy head into the noose but she answered stop stop i think i see my brother coming and again she sang and then she thought she saw her sister coming then her uncle then her aunt then her cousin but after this the hangman said i will stop no longer thou art making game of me thou must be hung at once but now she saw her sweetheart coming through the crowd and he held over his head in the air her own golden ball so she said stop stop i see my sweetheart coming sweetheart has brought my golden ball and come to set me free i have brought thy golden ball and come to set thee free i have not come to see thee hung upon this gallows tree and he took her home and they lived happily ever after end of the golden ball section 4 of more english fairy tales my own self this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi hak more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs my own self in a tiny house in the north country far away from any town or village there lived not long ago a poor widow all alone with her little son a 6 year old boy the house door opened straight on to the hillside and all around were moorlands and huge stones and swampy hollows never a house nor a sign of life wherever you might look for their nearest neighbors were the furleys in the glen below and the will o the wisps in the long grass along the path side and many a tale she could tell of the good folk calling to each other in the oak trees and the twinkling lights hopping on to the very window sill on dark nights but in spite of the loneliness she lived on from year to year in the little house perhaps because she was never asked to pay any rent for it but she did not care to sit up late when the fire burnt low and no one knew what might be about so when they'd had their supper she would make up a good fire and go off to bed so that if anything terrible did happen she could always hide her head under the bed clothes this however was far too early to please her little son so when she called him to bed he would go on playing beside the fire as if he did not hear her he had always been bad to do with since the day he was born and his mother did not often care to cross him indeed the more she tried to make him obey her the less heed he paid to anything she said so it usually ended by his taking his own way but one night just at the fore end of winter the widow could not make up her mind to go off to bed and leave him playing by the fireside for the wind was tugging at the door and rattling the window panes and well she knew that on such a night fairies and such like were bound to be out and about and bent on mischief so she tried to coax the boy into going at once to bed the safest bed to bide in such a night as this she said but no he wouldn't then she threatened to give him the stick but it was no use the more she begged and scolded the more he shook his head and when at last she lost patience and cried that the fairies would surely come and fetch him away he only laughed and said he wished they would 
for he would like one to play with at that his mother burst into tears and went off to bed in despair certain that after such words something dreadful would happen while her naughty little son sat on his stool by the fire not at all put out by her crying but he had not long been sitting there alone when he heard a fluttering sound near him in the chimney and presently down by his side dropped the tiniest wee girl you could think of she was not a span high and had hair like spun silver eyes as green as grass and cheeks red as june roses the little boy looked at her with surprise oh said he what do they call ye my own self she said in a shrill but sweet little voice and she looked at him too and what do they call ye just my own self too he answered cautiously and with that they began to play together she certainly showed him some fine games she made animals out of the ashes that looked and moved like life and trees with green leaves waving over tiny houses with men and women an inch high in them who when she breathed on them fell to walking and talking quite properly but the fire was getting low and the light dim and presently the little boy stirred the coals with a stick to make them blaze when out jumped a red-hot cinder and where should it fall but on the fairy child's tiny foot thereupon she set up such a squeal that the boy dropped the stick and clapped his hands to his ears but it grew to so shrill a screech that it was like all the wind in the world whistling through one tiny keyhole there was a sound in the chimney again but this time the little boy did not wait to see who it was but bolted off to bed where he hid under the blankets and listened in fear and trembling to what went on a voice came from the chimney speaking sharply who's there and what's wrong it said it's my own self sobbed the fairy child and my foot's burnt so Ooh. who did it said the voice angrily this time it sounded nearer and the boy peeping from under the clothes could see a white face looking out from the chimney opening just my own self too said the fairy child again then if ye did it your own self cried the elf mother shrilly what's the use of making all this fash about it and with that she stretched out a long thin arm caught the creature by its ear and shaking it roughly pulled it after her out of sight up the chimney the little boy lay awake a long time listening in case the fairy mother should come back after all and next evening after supper his mother was surprised to find that he was willing to go to bed whenever she liked he's taking a turn for the better at last she said to herself but he was thinking just then that when next a fairy came to play with him he might not get off quite so easily as he had done this time end of my own self Section 5 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Black Bull of Norway. In Norway, long time ago, there lived a certain lady, and she had three daughters. The oldest of them said to her mother, Mother, bake me a bannock, and roast me a collop, for I'm going away to seek my fortune. Her mother did so, and the daughter went away to an old witch washerwife, and told her purpose. The old wife bade her stay that day, and look out of her back door, and see what she could see. She saw naught the first day. The second day she did the same, and saw naught. On the third day she looked again, and saw a coach and six coming along the road. 
she ran in and told the old wife what she saw well quoth the old woman yon's for you so they took her into the coach and galloped off the second daughter next says to her mother mother bake me a bannock and roast me a collop for i'm going away to seek my fortune her mother did so and away she went to the old wife as her sister had done on the third day she looked out of the back door and saw a coach and four coming along the road well quoth the old woman yon's for you so they took her in and off they set the third daughter says to her mother mother bake me a bannock and roast me a collop for i'm going away to seek my fortune her mother did so and away she went to the old witch she bade her look out of her back door and see what she could see she did so and when she came back said she saw naught the second day she did the same and saw naught the third day she looked again and on coming back said to the old wife she saw naught but a great black bull coming crooning along the road well quoth the old witch yawns for you on hearing this she was next to distracted with grief and terror but she was lifted up and set on his back and away they went ay they travelled and on they travelled till the lady grew faint with hunger eat out of my right ear says the black bull and drink out of my left ear and set by your leavings so she did as he said and was wonderfully refreshed and long they rode and hard they rode till they came in sight of a very big and bonny castle yonder we must be this night quoth the bull for my elder brother lives yonder and presently they were at the place they lifted her off his back and took her in and sent him away to a park for the night in the morning when they brought the bull home they took the lady into a fine shining parlor and gave her a beautiful apple telling her not to break it till she was in the greatest strait ever mortal was in in the world and that would bring her out of it again she was lifted on the bull's back and after she had ridden far farther than i can tell they came in sight of a far bonnier castle and far farther away than the last says the bull to her yonder we must be this night for my second brother lives yonder and they were at the place directly they lifted her down and took her in and sent the bull to the field for the night in the morning they took the lady into a fine rich room and gave her the finest pear she had ever seen bidding her not to break it till she was in the greatest strait ever mortal could be in and that would get her out of it again she was lifted and set on his back and away they went and long they rode and hard they rode till they came in sight of the far biggest castle and far farthest off that they had yet seen we must be yonder to-night says the bull for my young brother lives yonder and they were there directly they lifted her down took her in and sent the bull to the field for the night in the morning they took her into a room the finest of all and gave her a plum telling her not to break it till she was in the greatest strait mortal could be in and that would get her out of it presently they brought home the bull set the lady on his back and away they went and i they rode and on they rode till they came to a dark and ugsome glen where they stopped and the lady lighted down says the bull to her here you must stay till i go and fight the old one you must seat yourself on that stone and move neither hand nor foot 
till I come back, else I'll never find you again. And if everything round about you turns blue, I have beaten the old one. But should all things turn red, he'll have conquered me. She set herself down on the stone, and by and by all around her turned blue. Overcome with joy, she lifted one of her feet and crossed it over the other. So glad was she that her companion was victorious. The bull returned and sought for her, but never could find her. Long she sat, and I she wept, till she wearied. At last she rose and went away, she didn't know where. On she wandered, till she came to a great hill of glass, that she tried all she could to climb, but wasn't able. Round the bottom of the hill she went, sobbing, and seeking a passage over, till at last she came to a smith's house, and the smith promised, if she would serve him seven years, he would make her iron shoon, wherewith she could climb the glassy hill. At seven years' end she got her iron shoon, clumb the glassy hill, and chanced to come to the old washerwife's habitation. There she was told of a gallant young knight that had given in some clothes all over blood to wash, and whoever washed them was to be his wife. The old wife had washed till she was tired, and then she set her daughter at it, and both washed, and they washed, and they washed, in hopes of getting the young knight. But for all they could do they couldn't bring out a stain. At length they set the stranger damsel to work and whenever she began the stains came out pure and clean. And the old wife made the knight believe it was her daughter had washed the clothes. So the knight and the eldest daughter were to be married, and the stranger damsel was distracted at the thought of it, for she was deeply in love with him. So she bethought her of her apple, and breaking it, found it filled with gold and precious jewelry, the richest she had ever seen. All these, she said to the eldest daughter, I will give you, on condition that you put off your marriage for one day, and allow me to go into his room alone at night. The lady consented, but meanwhile the old wife had prepared a sleeping drink, and given it to the knight, who drank it, and never wakened till next morning. The live-long night the damsel sobbed and sang, Seven long years I served for thee, the glassy hill I clumb for thee, thy bloody clothes I wrung for thee, and wilt thou not waken and turn to me? Next day she knew not what to do for grief. Then she broke the pear, and found it filled with jewellery far richer than the contents of the apple. With these jewels she bargained for permission to be a second knight in the young knight's chamber. But the old wife gave him another sleeping drink, and again he slept till morning. All night she kept sighing and singing as before. Seven long years I served for thee, the glassy hill I clumb for thee, thy bloody clothes I wrung for thee. And wilt thou not waken and turn to me? Still he slept, and she nearly lost hope altogether. But that day, when he was out hunting, somebody asked him what noise and moaning was that they heard all last night in his bedchamber. He said, I've heard no noise. But they assured him there was and he resolved to keep waking that night to try what he could hear. That being the third night, and the damsel being between hope and despair, she broke her plum, and it held far the richest jewellery of the three. She bargained as before, and the old wife as before took in the sleeping drink to the young knight's chamber. But he told her he couldn't drink it that night without sweetening, and when she went away for some honey to sweeten it with, 
he poured out the drink, and so made the old wife think he had drunk it. They all went to bed again, and the damsel began, as before, singing. Seven long years I served for thee, the glassy hill I clumb for thee, thy bloody clothes I wrung for thee, and wilt thou not waken and turn to me? He heard, and turned to her, and she told him all that had befallen her, and he told her all that had happened to him, and he caused the old washerwife and her daughter to be burnt, and they were married, and he and she are living happy to this day for aught I know. End of The Black Bull of Norway Section 6 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruhi Huck More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs Yallery Brown once upon a time and a very good time it was though it wasn't in my time nor in your time nor any one else's time there was a young lad of eighteen or so named tom tiver working on the hall farm one sunday he was walking across the west field twas a beautiful july night warm and still and the air was full of little sounds as though the trees and grass were chattering to themselves and all at once there came a bit ahead of him the pitifullest greetings ever he heard sob sobbing like a bairn spent with fear and nigh heartbroken breaking off into a moan and then rising again in a long whimpering wailing that made him feel sick to hark to it he began to look everywhere for the poor creature it must be sally bratton's child he thought to himself she was always a flighty thing and never looked after it like as not she's flaunting about the lanes and has clean forgot the babby but though he looked and looked he could see naught and presently the whimpering got louder and stronger in the quietness and he thought he could make out words of some sort he hearkened with all his ears and the sorry thing was saying words all mixed up with sobbing Ooh the stone the great big stone oh the stone's on top naturally he wondered where the stone might be and he looked again and there by the hedge bottom was a great flat stone nigh buried in the mools and hid in the cotted grass and weeds one of the stones was called the stranger's table however down he fell on his knee bones by that stone and hearkened again clearer than ever but tired and spent with greeting came the little sobbing voice ooh ooh the stone the stone on top he was gay and misliking to meddle with the thing but he couldn't stand the whimpering baby and he tore like mad at the stone till he felt it lifting from the mools and all at once it came with a sow out of the damp earth and the tangled grass and growing things and there in the hole lay a tiddy thing on its back blinking up at the moon and at him it was no bigger than a year-old baby but it had long cotted hair and beard twisted round and round its body so you couldn't see its clothes and the hair was all yaller and shining and silky like a bane's but the face of it was old as if it were hundreds of years since it was young and smooth just as a heap of wrinkles and two bright black eyne in the midst set in a lot of shining yellow hair and the skin was the colour of the fresh turned earth in spring brown as brown could be and its bare hands and feet were brown like the face of it the greeting had stopped but the tears were standing on its cheek and the tiddy thing looked mazed like in the moonshine and in the night air 
the creature's eye got used light to the moonlight and presently he looked up in tom's face as bold as ever was tom says he thou'rt a good lad as cool as thou can think says he tom thou'rt a good lad and his voice was soft and high and piping like a little bird twittering tom touched his hat and began to think what he ought to say houts says the thing again thou needn't be feared of me thou'st done me a better turn than thou knowest my lad and i'll do as much for thee tom couldn't speak yet but he thought lord for sure tis a buggle no says he as quick as quick i'm no buggle but ye'd best not ask me what i be anyways i be a good friend o thine tom's very knee bones struck for certainly an ordinary body couldn't have known what he'd been thinking to himself but he looked so kind like and spoke so fair that he made bold to get out a bit quavery like might i be axing to know your honour's name hm says he pulling his beard as for that and he thought a bit i so he went on at last yallery brown thou mayst call me yallery brown it's my nature seest thou and as for a name twill do as any other yallery brown tom yallery brown's thy friend my lad thank ye master says tom quite meek like and now he says i'm in a hurry to-night but tell me quick what'll i do for thee wilt have a wife i can give thee the finest lass in the town wilt be rich i give thee gold as much as thou can carry or wilt have help with thy work only say the word tom scratched his head well as for a wife i have no hankering after such they are but bothersome bodies and i have women folk at home as i'll mend my clouts and for gold that's as may be but for work there i can't abide work and if thou'lt give me a helping hand in it i'll thank stop says he quick as lightning i'll help thee in welcome but if ever thou sayest that to me if ever thou thankest me seest thou thou'lt never see me more find that now i want no thanks i'll have no thanks and he stamped his tiddy foot on the earth and looked as wicked as a raging bull mind that now great lump that thou be he went on calming down a bit and if ever thou needest help or gets into trouble call on me and just say yallery brown come from the mools i want thee and i'll be with thee at once and now says he picking a dandelion puff good night to thee and he blowed it up and it all came to tom's eyne and ears soon as tom could see again the tiddy creature was gone but for the stone on end and the hole at his feet he'd have thought he'd been dreaming well tom went home and to bed and by the morning he'd nigh forgot all about it but when he went to the work there was none to do all was done already the horses seen to and the stables cleaned out everything in its proper place and he'd nothing to do but sit with his hands in his pockets and so it went on day after day all the work done by yallery brown and better done too than he could have done it himself and if the master gave him more work he sat down and the work did itself the singeing irons or the broom or what not set to and with ne'er a hand put to it would get through in no time for he never saw yallery brown in daylight only in the darklings he saw him hopping about like a will o' the bike without his lanthorn at first twas mighty fine for tom he'd not to do but good pay for it but by and by things began to grow vicey varsy if the work was done for tom twas undone for the other lads if his buckets were filled theirs were upset if his tools were sharpened theirs were blunted and spoilt if his horses were clean as daisies theirs were splashed with muck and so on day in and day out twas the same and the lad saw yallery brown flitting about o nights and they saw the things working without hands o days and they saw that tom's work was done for him and theirs undone for them 
and naturally they begun to look shy on him and they wouldn't speak or come nigh him and they carried tales to the master and so things went from bad to worse for tom could do nothing himself the brooms wouldn't stay in his hand the plough ran away from him the hoe kept out of his grip he thought that he'd do his own work after all so that yallery brown would leave him and his neighbours alone but he couldn't true as death he couldn't he could only sit by and look on and have the cold shoulder turned on him while the unnatural thing was meddling with the others and working for him at last things got so bad that the master gave tom the sack and if he hadn't all the rest of the lads would have sacked him for they swore they'd not stay on the same garth with tom well naturally tom felt bad twas a very good place and good pay too and he was fair mad with yallery brown as t got him into such trouble so tom shook his fist in the air and called out as loud as he could yallery brown come from the moles thou scamp i want thee you'll scarce believe it but he'd hardly brought out the words but he felt something tweaking his leg behind while he jumped with the smart of it and soon as he looked down there was the tiddy thing with his shining hair and wrinkled face and wicked glinting black eyne tom was in a fine rage and he would have liked to have kicked him but twas no good there wasn't enough of it to get his boot against but he said look here master i'll thank thee to leave me alone after this dost hear i want none of thy help and i'll have naught more to do with thee see now the horrid thing broke into a screeching laugh and pointed its brown finger at tom ho ho tom says he thou thank me my lad and i told thee not i told thee not i don't want thy help i tell thee tom yelled at him i only never want to see thee again and to have naught more to do with thee thou can go the thing only laughed and screeched and mocked as long as tom went on swearing but as soon as his breath gave out tom my lad he said with a grin i'll tell ye summat tom true's true i'll never help thee again and call as thou wilt thou'lt never see me after to-day but i never said that i'd leave thee alone tom and i never will my lad i was nice and safe under the stone tom and could do no harm but thou let me out thyself and thou can't put me back again i would have been thy friend and worked for thee if thou had been wise but since thou beest no more than a born fool i'll give ee no more than a born fool's luck and when all goes vicey varsy and everything a gee thou'lt mind that it's yallery brown's doing though mappin thou doesn't see him mark my words will ye and he began to sing dancing around tom like a bairn with his yellow hair but looking older than ever with his grinning wrinkled bit of a face work as thou will thou'lt never do well work as thou mayst thou'lt never gain grist for harm and mischance and yallery brown thou'st let out thyself from under the stone tom could never rightly mind what he said next this was all cussing and calling down misfortune on him but he was so mazed in fright that he could only stand there shaking all over and staring down at the horrid thing and if he'd gone on long tom would have tumbled down in a fit but by and by his yaller shining hair rose up in the air and wrapped itself round him till he looked for all the world like a great dandelion puff and it floated away on the wind over the wall and out of sight with a parting skirl of wicked voice and sneering laugh and did it come true says thou my word but it did sure as death he worked here and he worked there and turned his hand to this and to that but it always went agee and twas all yallery brown's doing and the children died and the crops rotted the beasts never fatted and nothing ever did well with him and till he was dead and buried and nappen even afterwards there was no end to yallery brown's spite at him day in 
and day out he used to hear him saying work as thou will thou'lt never do well work as thou mayst thou'lt never gain grist for harm and mischance and yallery brown thou'st let out thyself from under the stone end of yallery brown section seven of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs three feathers once upon a time there was a girl who was married to a husband that she never saw and the way this was was that he was only at home at night and would never have any light in the house the girl thought that was funny and all her friends told her there must be something wrong with her husband some great deformity that made him want not to be seen well one night when he came home she suddenly lit a candle and saw him he was handsome enough to make all the women of the world fall in love with him but scarcely had she seen him when he began to change into a bird and then he said now you have seen me you shall see me no more unless you are willing to serve seven years and a day for me so that i may become a man once more then he told her to take three feathers from under his side and whatever she wished through them would come to pass then he left her at a great house to be laundry maid for seven years and a day and the girl used to take the feathers and say by virtue of my three feathers may the copper be lit and the clothes washed and mangled and folded and put away to the missus's satisfaction and then she had no more care about it the feathers did the rest and the lady set great store by her for a better laundress than she had never had well one day the butler who had a notion to have the pretty laundry made for his wife said to her he should have spoken before but he did not want to vex her why should it when i am but a fellow-servant the girl said and then he felt free to go on and explain he had the seventy pounds laid by with the master and how would she like him for a husband and the girl told him to fetch the money and he asked his master for it and brought it to her but as they were going upstairs she cried oh john i must go back sure i've left my shutters undone and they'll be slashing and banging all night the butler said never you trouble i'll put them right and he ran back while she took her feathers and said by virtue of my three feathers may the shutters slash and bang till morning and john not be able to fasten them not nor yet to get his fingers free from them and so it was try as he might the butler could not leave hold nor yet keep the shutters from blowing open as he closed them and he was angry but could not help himself and he did not care to tell of it and get the laugh on him so no one knew then after a bit the coachman began to notice her and she found he had some forty pounds with the master and he said she might have it if she would take him with it so after the laundry maid had his money in her apron and she went merrily along she stopped exclaiming my clothes are left outside i must run back and bring them in stop for me while i go it is a cold frost night said william you'd be catching your death so the girl waited long enough to take her feathers out and say by virtue of my three feathers may the clothes slash and blow about till morning and may william not be able to take his hand from them nor yet to gather them up and then she was away to bed and to sleep the coachman did not want to be every one's jest and he said nothing so after a bit the footman comes to her and said he i have been with my master for years and have saved up a good bit and you have been three years here and must have saved up as well let us put it together 
and make us a home or else stay on at service that pleases you well she got him to bring the savings to her as the others had and then she pretended she was faint and said to him james i feel so queer run down cellar for me that's a dear and fetch me up a drop of brandy now no sooner had he started than she said by virtue of my three feathers may there be slashing and spilling and james not be able to pour the brandy straight nor yet to take his hand from it until morning and so it was try as he might james could not get his glass filled and there was slashing and spilling and right on it all down came the master to know what it meant so james told him he could not make it out but he could not get the drop of brandy the laundry maid had asked for and his hand would shake and spill everything and yet come away he could not this got him in for a regular scrape and the master when he got back to his wife said what has come over the men they were all right until that laundry maid of yours came something is up now though they have all drawn out their pay and yet they don't leave and what can it be anyway but his wife said she could not hear of the laundry maid being blamed for she was the best servant she had and worth all the rest put together so it went on until one day as the girl stood in the hall door the coachman happened to say to the footman do you know how that girl served me james and then william told about the clothes the butler put in that was nothing to what she served me and he told of the shutters clapping all night just then the master came through the hall and the girl said by virtue of my three feathers may there be slashing and striving between master and men and may all get splashed in the pond and so it was the men fell to disputing which had suffered the most by her and when the master came up all would be heard at once and none listened to him and it came to blows all round and the first they knew they had shoved one another into the pond when the girl thought they had had enough she took the spell off and the master asked her what had begun the row for he had not heard in the confusion and the girl said they were ready to fall on any one they'd have beat me if you had not come by so it blew over for that time and through her feathers she made the best laundress ever known but to make a long story short when the seven years and a day were up the bird husband who had known her doings all along came after her restored to his own shape again and he told her mistress that he had come to take her from being a servant and that she should have servants under her but he did not tell of the feathers and then he bade her give the men back their savings that was a rare game you had with them said he but now you're going where there is plenty leave them each their own so she did and they drove off to their castle where they lived happily ever after end of three feathers Section 8 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruhi Huck More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs sir gamma vans last sunday morning at six o'clock in the evening as i was sailing over the tops of the mountains in my little boat i met two men on horseback riding on one mare so i asked them could they tell me whether the little old woman was dead yet who had hanged last saturday week for drowning herself in a shower of feathers they said they could not positively inform me but if i went to sir gamma 
vans he could tell me all about it but how am i to know the house said i ho oh, tis easy enough for tis a brick house said they built entirely of flints standing alone by itself in the middle of sixty or seventy others just like it oh nothing in the world is easier said i nothing can be easier said they so i went on my way now this sir g vans was a giant and a bottle maker and as all giants who are bottle makers usually pop out of a little thumb bottle from behind the door so did sir g vans how do you do said he very well i thank you says i have some breakfast with me with all my heart says i so he gave me a slice of beer and a cup of cold veal and there was a little dog under the table that picked up all the crumbs hang him says i no don't hang him says he for he killed a hare yesterday and if you don't believe me i'll show you the hare alive in a basket so he took me into his garden to show me the curiosities in one corner there was a fox hatching eagle's eggs in another there was an iron apple tree entirely covered with pears and lead in the third there was a hare which the dog killed yesterday alive in the basket and in the fourth there were twenty-four hipper switches threshing tobacco and at the sight of me they threshed so hard that they drove the plug through the wall and threw a little dog that was passing by on the other side i hearing the dog howl jumped over the wall and turned it as neatly inside out as possible when it ran away as if it had not an hour to live then he took me into the park to show me his deer and i remembered that i had a warrant in my pocket to shoot venison for his majesty's dinner so i set fire to my bow poised my arrow and shot amongst them i broke seventeen ribs on one side and twenty-one and a half on the other but my arrow passed clean through without ever touching it and the worst was i lost my arrow however i found it again in the hollow of a tree i felt it it felt clammy i smelt it it smelt honey ho ho said i here's a bee's nest when out sprang a covey of partridges i shot at them some say i killed eighteen but i am sure i killed thirty-six besides a dead salmon which was flying over the bridge of which i made the best apple pie i ever tasted end of sir gamma vans section nine of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs tom hickathrift before the days of william the conqueror there dwelt a man in the marsh of the isle of ely whose name was thomas hickathrift a poor day labourer but so stout that he could do two days work in one his one son he called by his own name thomas hickathrift and he put him to good learning but the lad was none of the wisest and indeed seemed to be somewhat soft so he got no good at all from his teaching tom's father died and his mother being tender of him kept him as well as she could the slothful fellow would do nothing but sit in the chimney corner and eat as much at a time as would serve four or five ordinary men and so much did he grow that when but ten years old he was already eight feet high and his hand like a shoulder of mutton one day his mother went to a rich farmer's house to beg a bottle of straw for herself and tom take what you will said the farmer 
an honest charitable man so when she got home she told tom to fetch the straw but he wouldn't and beg as she might he wouldn't till she borrowed him a cart rope so off he went and when he came to the farmers master and men were all a thrashing in the barn i'm come for the straw said tom take as much as thou canst carry said the farmer so tom laid down his rope and began to make his bottle your rope is too short said the farmer by way of a joke but the joke was on tom's side for when he had made up his load there was some twenty hundredweight of straw and though they called him a fool for thinking he could carry the tithe of it he flung it over his shoulder as if it had been a hundredweight to the great admiration of master and men tom's strength being thus made known there was no longer any basking by the fire for him every one would be hiring him to work and telling him twas a shame to live such a lazy life so tom seeing them wait on him as they did went to work first with one then with another and one day a woodman desired his help to bring home a tree off went tom and four men besides and when they came to the tree they began to draw it into the cart with pulleys at last tom seeing them unable to lift it stand away you fools said he and taking the tree set it on one end and laid it in the cart now said he see what a man can do marry tis true said they and the woodman asked what reward he'd take oh a stick for my mother's fire said tom and espying a tree bigger than was in the cart he laid it on his shoulders and went home with it as fast as the cart and six horses could draw it tom now saw that he had more strength than twenty men and began to be very merry taking delight in company in going to fairs and meetings in seeing sports and pastimes and at cudgels wrestling or throwing the hammer not a man could stand against him so that at last none durst go into the ring to wrestle with him and his fame was spread more and more in the country far and near he would go to any meetings as football play or the like and one day in a part of the country where he was a stranger and none knew him he stopped to watch the company at football play rare sport it was but tom spoiled it all for meeting the ball he took it such a kick that away it flew none could tell whither they were angry with tom as you may fancy but got nothing by that as tom took hold of a big spar and laid about with a will so that though the whole countryside was up in arms against him he cleared his way wherever he came it was late in the evening ere he could turn homeward and on the road there met him four lusty rogues that had been robbing passengers all day they thought they had a good prize in tom who was all alone and made cocksure of his money stand and deliver said they what should i deliver said tom your money sir said they you shall give me better words for it first said tom come come no more prating money we want and money we'll have before you stir is it so said tom nay then come and take it the long and short of it was that tom killed two of the rogues and grievously wounded the other two and took all their money which was as much as two hundred pounds and when he came home he made his old mother laugh with the story of how he served the football players and the four thieves but you shall see that tom sometimes met his match in wandering one day in the forest he met a lusty tinker 
that had a good staff on his shoulder and a great dog to carry his bag and tools whence come you and whither are you gone said tom this is no highway what's that to you said the tinker fools must needs be meddlin i'll make you know said tom before you and i part what it is to me well said the tinker i'm ready for a belt with any man and i hear there is one tom hickathrift in the country of whom great things are told i'd fain see him to have a turn with him ay said tom methinks he might be master with you anyhow i am the man what have you to say to me why verily i am glad we are so happily met sure you do but jest said tom marry i'm in earnest said the tinker a match tis done let me fuss get a twig said tom ay said the tinker hang him that would fight a man unarmed so tom took a gate rail for his staff and at it they fell the tinker at tom and tom at the tinker like two giants they laid on at each other the tinker had a leathern coat on and at every blow tom gave the tinker his coat roared again yet the tinker did not give way one inch at last tom gave him a blow on the side of his head which felled him now tinker where are you said tom but the tinker being a nimble fellow leapt up again gave tom a blow that made him reel again and followed his blow with one on the other side that made tom's neck crack again so tom flung down his weapon and yielded the tinker the better on it took him home to his house where they nursed their bruises and from that day forth there was no stauncher pair of friends than they two tom's fame was thus spread abroad till at length a brewer at lynn wanting a good lusty man to carry his beer to wisbeach went to hire tom and promised him a new suit of clothes from top to toe and that he should eat and drink of the best so tom yielded to be his man and his master told him what way he should go for you must understand there was a monstrous giant who kept part of the marshland so that none durst go that way so tom went every day to wisbeach a good twenty miles by the road twas a wearisome journey thought tom and he soon found that the way kept by the giant was nearer by half now tom had got more strength than ever being well kept as he was and drinking so much strong ale as he did one day then as he was going to wisbeach without saying anything to his master or any of his fellow-servants he resolved to take the nearest road or to lose his life as they say to win horse or lose saddle thus resolved he took the near road flinging open the gates for his cart and horses to go through at last the giant spied him and came up speedily intending to take his beer for a prize he met tom like a lion as though he would have swallowed him who gave you authority to come this way roared he i'll make you an example for all rogues under the sun see how many heads hang on yonder tree yours shall hang higher than all the rest for a warning but tom made him answer a fig in your teeth you shall not find me like one of them traitorly rogue that you are the giant took these words in high disdain and ran into his cave to fetch his great club intending to dash out tom's brains at the first blow tom knew not what to do for a weapon his whip would be but little good against a monstrous beast twelve foot in length and six foot about the waist but whilst the giant went for his club 
bethinking him of a very good weapon he made no more ado but took his cart turned it upside down and took axle tree and wheel for shield and buckler and very good weapons they were found out came the giant and began to stare at tom you are like to do great service with those weapons roared he i have here a twig that will beat you and your wheel to the ground now this twig was as thick as some mileposts are but tom was not daunted for all that though the giant made at him with such force that the wheel cracked again but tom gave as good as he got taking the giant such a weighty blow on the side of the head that he reeled again what said tom are you drunk with my strong beer already so at it they went tom laying such huge blows at the giant down whose face sweat and blood ran together so that being fat and foggy and tired with the long fighting he asked tom would he let him drink a little nay nay said tom my mother did not teach me such wit who'd be a fool then and seeing the giant beginning to weary and fail in his blows tom thought best to make hay whilst the sun shone and laying on as fast as though he had been mad he brought the giant to the ground in vain were the giant's roars and prayers and promises to yield himself and be tom's servant tom laid at him till he was dead and then cutting off his head he went into the cave and found a great store of silver and gold which made his heart to leap so he loaded his cart and after delivering his beer at wisbeach he came home and told his master what had befallen him and on the morrow he and his master and more of the townsfolk of lynn set out for the giant's cave tom showed them the head and what silver and gold there was in the cave and not a man but leapt for joy for the giant was a great enemy to all the country the news was spread all up and down the countryside how tom hickathrift had killed the giant and well was he that could run to see the cave all the folk made bonfires for joy and if tom was respected before he was much more so now with common consent he took possession of the cave and every one said had it been twice as much he would have deserved it so tom pulled down the cave and built himself a brave house the ground that the giant kept by force for himself tom gave part to the poor for their common land and part he turned into good wheat land to keep himself and his old mother jane hickathrift and now he was become the chiefest man in the countryside twas no longer plain tom but mr hickathrift and he was held in due respect i promise you he kept men and maids and lived most bravely made him a park to keep deer and time passed with him happily in his great house till the end of his days end of tom hickathrift Recording by Steve Chilvers, Norwich, England. Section 10 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lydia. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Headley Cow. There was once an old woman who earned a poor living by going errands and such like for the farmer's wives round about the village where she lived. It wasn't much she earned by it, but with a plate of meat at one house and a cup of tea at another, she made shift to get on somehow, and always looked as cheerful as if she hadn't a want in the world. Well, one summer evening, as she was trotting away homewards, she came upon a big black pot lying at the side of the road. Now that, said she, stopping to look at it, would be just the very thing for me if I had anything to put into it. But who can have left it here? 
and she looked round about as if the person it belonged to must not be far off but she could see no one maybe it'll have a hole in it she said thoughtfully ay that'll be how they've left it lying hinny but then it'd do fine to put a flower in it for the window i think i'll just take it home anyways and she bent her stiff old back and lifted the lid to look inside mercy me she cried and jumped back to the other side of the road if it is fit brim full of gold pieces for a while she could do nothing but walk round and round her treasure admiring the yellow gold and wondering at her good luck and saying to herself about every two minutes well i do be feeling rich and grand but presently she began to think how she could best take it home with her and she couldn't see any other way than by fastening one end of her shawl to it and so dragging it after her along the road it'll certainly soon be dark she said to herself and folk will not see what i'm bringing home with me and so i'll have all the night to myself to think what i'll do with it i could buy a grand house and all and live like the queen herself and not do a stroke of work all day but just sit by the fire with a cup of tea or maybe i'll give it to the priest to keep for me and get a piece as i'm wanting or maybe i'll just bury it in a hole at the garden foot and put it on a bit of chimney between the chiny teapot and the spoons for ornament like oh i feel so grand i don't know myself rightly and by this time being already rather tired with dragging such a heavy weight after her she stopped to rest for a minute turning to make sure that her treasure was safe but when she looked at it it wasn't a pot of gold at all but a great lump of shining silver she stared at it and rubbed her eyes and stared at it again but she couldn't make it look like anything but a great lump of silver i'd have sworn it was a pot of gold she said at last but i reckon i must have been dreaming ay now that's a change for the better it'll be far less trouble to look after and none so easy stolen yon gold pieces would have been a sight of bother to keep em safe ay i'm well quit of em and with my bonny lump i'm as rich as rich and she set off homewards again cheerfully planning all the grand things she was going to do with her money it wasn't very long however before she got tired again and stopped once more to rest for a minute or two again she turned to look at her treasure and as soon as she set eyes on it she cried out in astonishment oh my said she now it's a lump o' iron well that beats all and it's just real convenient i can sell it easy as easy and get a lot o' penny pieces for it ay hinny and it's much handier than a lot o' your gold and silver as it have kept me from sleeping a night's sleep and the neighbours were robbing me and it's a real good thing to have by you in the house ye niver can tell what ye might use it for and it'll sell ay for a real lot rich i'll just be rolling and on she trotted again chuckling to herself on her good luck till presently she glanced over her shoulder just to make sure it was still there as she said to herself eh my she cried as soon as she saw it if it hasn't gone and turned itself into a great stone this time now how could it have known that i was just terrible wanting something to hold my door open with ay if that isn't a good change hinny it's a fine thing to have such good luck and all in a hurry to see how the stone would look in its corner by her door she trotted off down the hill and stopped at the foot beside her own little gate when she had unlatched it she turned to unfasten her shawl from the stone which at this time seemed to un lie unchanged and peaceably on the path beside her there was still plenty of light and she could see the stone quite plainly as she bent her stiff back over it to untie the shawl end when all of a sudden it seemed to give a jump and a squeal and grew in a moment as big as a great horse then it threw down four lanky legs and shook out two long ears flourished a tail and went off kicking its feet into the night and laughing like a naughty mocking boy the old woman stared after it till it was fairly out of sight well she said at last i do be the luckiest body hereabouts fancy me seeing the headly cow all to myself and making so free with it too i can tell you i do feel that grand and she went into her cottage and sat down by the fire to think over her good luck End of the Headley Cow Recording by Lydia Section 11 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Maria Casper more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs gaborn seer once there was a man gaborn seer and he had a son called jack one day he sent him out to sell a sheepskin 
and Gaborn said, "'You must bring me back the skin and the value of it as well.' So Jack started, but he could not find any who would leave him the skin and give him its price too, so he came home discouraged. But Gaborn Seer said, "'Never mind, you must take another turn at it to-morrow.' So he tried again, and nobody wished to buy the skin on those terms. When he came home, his father said, "'You must go and try your luck to-morrow.' And the third day it seemed as if it would be the same thing all over again. And he had half a mind not to go back at all, his father would be so vexed. As he came to a bridge, like the creek road one yonder, he leaned on the parapet, thinking of his trouble, and that perhaps it would be foolish to run away from home, but he could not tell which to do, when he saw a girl washing her clothes on the bank below. She looked up and said, "'If it may be no offence asking, what is it you feel so badly about?' "'My father has given me this skin, and I am to fetch it back, and the price of it beside.' "'Is that all? Give it here, and it's easy done.' So the girl washed the skin in the stream, took the wool from it, and paid him the value of it, and gave him the skin to carry back. His father was well pleased, and said to Jack, "'That was a witty woman. She would make you a good wife. Do you think you could tell her again?' Jack thought he could. So his father told him to go by and by to the bridge and see if she was there, and if so, bid her come home to take tea with them. And sure enough, Jack spied her, and told her how his old father had a wish to meet her, and would she be pleased to drink tea with them. The girl thanked him kindly, and said she could come the next day. She was too busy at the moment. "'All the better,' said Jack. "'I'll have time to make ready.' So when she came, Gaborn Seer could see she was a witty woman, and he asked her if she would marry his Jack. She said yes, and they were married. Not long after, Jack's father told him he must come with him, and build the finest castle that ever was seen, for a king who wished to outdo all others by his wonderful castle. As they went to lay the foundation stone, Gaborn Seer said to Jack, can't you shorten the way for me? But Jack looked ahead, and there was a long road before them, and he said, I don't see, father, how I could break a bit off. They are no good to me, then, and had best be off home. So poor Jack turned back, and when he came in, his wife said, Why, how's this? You've come alone. And he told her what his father had said, and his answer. "'You stupid,' said his witty wife. "'If you had told him a tale, you would have shortened the road. "'Now listen, till I tell you a story. "'And then catch up with Gaborn Seer and begin it at once. "'He will like hearing it, and by the time you are done "'you will have reached the foundation stone.' "'So Jack sweated and overtook his father. "'Gaborn Seer said never a word. "'But Jack began his story.' and the road was shortened, just as his wife had said. When they came to the end of their journey, they started building of this castle, which was to outshine all others. Now the wife had advised them to be intimate with the servants, and so they did as she said, and it was, Good morning and good day to you, as they passed in and out. Now, at the end of a twelve-month, Gaborn, the wise man, had built such a castle that thousands were gathered to admire it. And the king said, "'The castle is done. I shall return to-morrow and pay you all.' "'I have just a ceiling to finish in an upper lobby,' said Gaborn, "'and then it wants for nothing.' But after the king was gone off, the housekeeper sent for Gaborn and Jack, and told them that she had watched for a chance to warn them, for the king was so afraid they should carry their art away and build some other king as fine a castle, he meant to take their lives on the morrow. Gaborn told Jack to keep a good heart, and they would come off all right. 
when the king had come back gobborn told him he had been unable to complete the job for lack of a tool left at home and he should like to send jack after it no no said the king cannot one of the men do the errand no they could not make themselves understood said the seer but jack could do the errand you and your son are to stop here but how will it do if i send my own son that will do so gobborn sent by him a message to jack's wife give him crooked and straight now there was a little hole in the wall rather high up and jack's wife tried to reach up into a chest there after crooked and straight but at last she asked the king's son to help her because his arms were longer but when he was leaning over the chest she caught him by the two heels and threw him into the chest and fastened it down so there he was both crooked and straight then he begged for pen and ink which she brought him but he was not allowed out and holes were bored that he might breathe when his letter came telling the king his father he was to be let free when gobborn and jack were safe home the king saw he must settle for the building and let them come away as they left gobborn told him now that jack was done with this work he should soon build a castle for his witty wife far superior to the king's which he did and they lived there happily ever after end of gobborn seer section 12 of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by zames curran more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs lock a mercy me there was no woman as i've heard tell she went to the market her eggs for to sell she went to the market all on a market day and she fell asleep on the king's highway there came by a peddler whose name was stout he cut her petticoats round about he cut her petticoats up to the knees which made the old woman to shiver and freeze when this old woman first did wake she began to shiver and she began to shake she began to wonder and she began to cry lock a mercy me this is none of i but if it be i as i do hope it be i've a little dog at home and he'll know me if it be i he'll wag his little tail and if it not be i he'll loudly bark and wail home went the little woman all in the dark up got the little dog and he began to bark he began to bark so she began to cry lock a mercy me this is none of i end of lock a mercy me this recording by zames curran visit my website at noveltheory.com section 13 of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by daniel noonan Kalin, Perthshire, Scotland. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. Tattercoats. In a great palace by the sea there once dwelt a very rich old lord, who had neither wife nor children living, only one granddaughter, whose face he had never seen in all her life. He hated her bitterly, because at her birth his favourite daughter died, and when the old nurse brought him the baby, he swore that it might live or die as it liked but he would never look on its face as long as it lived. So he turned his back and sat by his window looking out over the sea, and weeping great tears for his lost daughter till his white hair and beard grew down over his shoulders and twined round his chair and crept into the chinks of the floor, and his tears dropping out onto the window ledge wore a channel through the stone and ran away in a little river to the great sea. 
and meanwhile his granddaughter grew up with no one to care for her or clothe her. Only the old nurse, when no one was by, would sometimes give her a dish of scraps from the kitchen, or a torn petticoat from the ragbag, while the other servants of the palace would drive her from the house with blows and mocking words, calling her tattercoats, and pointing at her bare feet and shoulders, till she ran away crying to hide among the bushes. And so she grew up with little to eat or wear, spending her days in the fields and lanes, with only the goose herd for a companion, who would play to her so merrily on his little pipe when she was hungry or cold or tired that she forgot all her troubles and fell to dancing with his flock of noisy geese for partners. But one day people told each other that the king was travelling through the land, and in the town nearby was to give a great ball to all the lords and ladies of the country when the prince, his only son, was to choose a wife. One of the royal invitations was brought up to the palace by the sea, and the servants carried it up to the old lord, who still sat by his window, wrapped in his long white hair and weeping into the little river that was fed by his tears. But when he heard the king's command, he dried his eyes and bade them bring shears to cut him loose, for his hair had bound him a fast prisoner, and he could not move. And then he sent them for rich clothes and jewels, which he put on, and he ordered them to saddle the white horse with golden silk that he might ride to meet the king. Meanwhile, Tattercoats had heard of the great doings in the town, and she sat by the kitchen door weeping because she could not go to see them. And when the old nurse heard her crying, she went to the lord of the palace and begged him to take his granddaughter to the king's ball. But he only frowned and told her to be silent, while the servants laughed and said, Tattercoats is happy in her rags, playing with the goose herd. Let her be, it is all she is fit for. A second, and then a third time, the old nurse begged him to let the girl go with him, but she was answered only by black looks and fierce words, till she was driven from the room by the jeering servants with blows and mocking words. Weeping over her ill success, the old nurse went to look for tattercoats, but the girl had been turned from the door by the cook, and had run away to tell her friend the gooseherd how unhappy she was because she could not go to the king's ball. But when the gooseherd had listened to her story, he bade her cheer up, and proposed that they should go together into the town to see the king, and all the fine things, and when she looked sorrowfully down at her rags and bare feet, he played a note or two upon his pipe, so gay and merry that she forgot all about her tears and her troubles, and before she well knew, the herd boy had taken her by the hand, and she and he and the geese before them were dancing down the road toward the town. Before they had gone very far, a handsome young man, splendidly dressed, rode up and stopped to ask the way to the castle where the king was staying. And when he found that they two were going thither, he got off his horse and walked beside them along the road. The herd boy pulled out his pipe and played a low sweet tune, and the stranger looked again and again at Tattercoats's lovely face, till he fell deeply in love with her and begged her to marry him. But she only laughed and shook her golden head. You would be finally put to shame if you had a goose girl for your wife said she. Go and ask one of the great ladies you will see tonight at the king's ball, and do not flout poor Tattercoats. But the more she refused him, the sweeter the pipe played, and the deeper the young man fell in love, till at last he begged her, as a proof of his sincerity, to come that night at twelve to the king's ball, just as she was, with the herd boy and his geese, and in her torn petticoat and bare feet, and he would dance with her before the king, and the lords and ladies, and present her to them all as his dear and honoured bride. So when the night came, and the hall in the castle was full of light and music, and the lords and ladies were dancing before the king, just as the clock struck twelve, Tattercoats and the herd boy, followed by his flock of noisy geese, entered at the great doors, and walked straight up the ballroom, while on either side the ladies whispered, the lords laughed, and the king seated at the far end stared in amazement. But as they came in front of the throne, Tattercoats's lover rose from beside the king, and came to meet her. Taking her by the hand, he kissed her thrice before them all, and turned to the king. Father, he said, for it was the prince himself, I have made my choice, and here is my bride, the loveliest girl in all the land, and the sweetest as well. Before he had finished speaking, the herd boy put his pipe to his lips 
and played a few low notes that sounded like a bird singing far off in the woods. And as he played, Tattercoats' rags were changed to shining robes sewn with glittering jewels. A golden crown lay upon her golden hair, and the flock of geese behind her became a crowd of dainty pages bearing her long train. And as the king rose to greet her as his daughter, the trumpet sounded loudly in honour of the new princess, and the people outside in the street said to each other, Ah! Now the prince has chosen for his wife the loveliest girl in all the land. But the goose herd was never seen again, and no one knew what became of him, while the old lord went home once more to his palace by the sea, for he could not stay at court, when he had sworn never to look on his granddaughter's face. So there he still sits by his window, if you could only see him, as you some day may, weeping more bitterly than ever as he looks out over the sea. End of Tattercoats Recording by Daniel Noonan, Killin, Perthshire, Scotland Section 14 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Douglas Taylor Port Townsend, Washington. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Wee Bannock. Granny, Granny, come tell us the story of the Wee Bannock. How oh, children, you've heard it all a hundred times afore. I needn't tell it over again. Ah, but Granny, it's such a fine one. You must tell it just once. Well, well, if you'll all promise to be good, I'll tell it ye again. There lived an old man and an old woman at the side of a burn. They had two cows, five hens and a cock, a cat and two kittens. The old man looked after the cows and the old wife span on the distaff. The kitten soft gripped at the old wife's spindle as it tussled over the hearthstone. Shaw, sure, shaw, sure, she would say, go away, and so it tussled about. One day, after breakfast, she thought she would have a bannock, so she baked two oatmeal bannocks and set them onto the fire to harden. After a while, the old man came in and sat down beside the fire and takes one of the bannocks and snaps it through the middle. When the other one sees this, it runs off as fast as it could, and the old wife after it with the spindle in the one hand and the distaff in the other. But the wee bannock ran away and out of sight and ran till it came to a pretty large thatched house, and it ran boldly up inside to the fireside, and there were three tailors sitting on a big bench. When they saw the wee bannock come in, they jumped up and got behind the good wife that was carding tow by the fire. Out, quoth she, be no afeard, it's but a wee bannock, grip it, and I'll give ye a sup of milk with it. Up she gets with the tow cards, and the tailor with the goose, and the two prentices, the one with the big shears, and the other with the law broad. But it dodged them, and ran round about the fire, and one of the prentices, thinking to snap it with the shears, fell into the ashes. The tailor cast the goose, and the good wife the tow cards, but it wouldn't do. The bannock ran away, and ran till it came to a wee house at the roadside, and in it runs, and there was a weaver sitting at the loom, and the wife winding a clue of yarn. Tibby, quoth he, what's that? Oh, quoth she, it's a wee bannock. It's well come, quoth he, for our porridge were but thin to-day. Grip it, my woman, grip it. Aye, quoth she. What racks? That's a clever bannock. Catch it, Willie, catch it, man. Out, quoth Willie. Cast the clue at it. But the bannock dodged round about, and off it went, and over the hill, like a new tarred sheep or a mad cow. And forward it runs to the neat house, to the fireside, and there was the good wife churning. Come away, we bannock, quoth she. I'll have cream and bread to-day. But the wee bannock dodged round about the churn, and the wife after it, and in the hurry she had near hand overturned the churn, and before she got it set right again, the wee bannock was off and down the bray to the mill, and in it ran. The miller was sifting meal in the trough, 
but looking up, Ay, quoth he, it's a sign of plenty when ye're running about and nobody to look after ye. But I like a bannock and cheese. Come your way hither, and I'll give ye a night's quarters. But the bannock wouldn't trust itself with the miller and its cheese, so it turned and ran its way out. But the miller didn't fash his head with it, so it toddled away and ran till it came to the smithy, and in it runs and up to the anvil. The smith was making horse nails. Quoth he, I like a glass of good ale and a well toasted bannock. Come your way and buy here. But the bannock was frightened when it heard about the ale, and turned and was off as hard as it could, and the smith after it, and cast the hammer. But it missed, and the bannock was out of sight in a crack, and ran till it came to a farmhouse with a good peat stack at the end of it. Inside it runs to the fireside. The good man was cloving lent, and the good wife heckling. Oh, Janet, quoth he, there's a wee bannock. I'll have the half of it. Well, John, I'll have the other half. Hit it over the back with the clove. But the bannock played dodgings. Out, out, quoth the wife, and made the heckle flee at it. But it was too clever for her. And off and up the burn it ran to the next house, and rolled its way to the fireside. The good wife was stirring the soup, and the good man plating sprit binnings for the cows. Ho, oh, Jock, quoth the good wife, here come. You're always crying about a wee bannock. Here's one. Come in, haste ye, and I'll help ye to grip it. Ay, mother, where is it? See, there, run over on that side. But the bannock ran in behind the good man's chair. Jock fell among the sprits. The good man cast a binning, and the good wife the spurtle. But it was too clever for Jock and her both. It was off and out of sight in a crack, and through among the winds and down the road to the next house, and in and snug by the fireside. The folk were just sitting down to their soup, and the good wife scraped in the pot. Look, quoth she, there's a wee bannock come in to warm itself at our fireside. Shut the door, quoth the good man, and we'll try to get a grip of it. When the bannock heard that, it ran out of the house, and they after it with their spoons, and the good man shied his hat. But it rolled away, and ran and ran, till it came to another house, and when it went in, the folk were just going to their beds. The good man was taking off his breeches, and the good wife raking the fire. "'What's that?' quoth he. "'Oh,' quoth she, "'it's a wee bannock.' Quoth he, "'I could eat the half of it.' "'Grip it,' quoth the wife, "'and I'll have a bit too.' "'Cast your breeches at it,' the good man shied his breeches, and had nearly smothered it, but it wriggled out, and ran, and the good man after it without his breeches, and there was a clean chase over the craft park, and in among the winds, and the good man lost it, and had to come away, trotting home half-naked. But now it was grown dark, and the wee bannock couldn't see but it went into the side of a big whin bush and into a fox's hole. The fox had had no meat for two days. Oh, welcome, welcome, quoth the fox, and snapped it in two in the middle. And that was the end of the wee bannock. End of the wee bannock. Recording by Douglas Taylor, Port Townsend, Washington. Section 15 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. Johnny Gloak. Johnny Gloak was a tailor by trade. But, like a man of spirit, he grew tired of his tailoring, and wished to follow some other path that would lead to honor and fame. But he did not know what to do at first to gain fame and fortune. So for a time he was fonder of basking idly in the sun than in plying the needle and scissors. One warm day, as he was enjoying his ease, he was annoyed by the flies alighting on his bare ankles. He brought his hand down on them with force, and killed a goodly number of them. On counting the victims of his valour, he was overjoyed at his success. 
his heart rose to the doing of great deeds, and he gave vent to his feelings in the saying, "'Well done, Johnny Gloak, kilt fifty flies at one stroke.' His resolution was now taken to cut out his path to fortune and honour, so he took down from its resting-place a rusty old sword that had belonged to some of his forebears, and set out in search of adventures. After travelling a long way, he came to a country that was much troubled by two giants, whom no one was bold enough to meet, or strong enough to overcome. He was soon told of the giants, and learned that the king of that country had offered a great reward and the hand of his daughter in marriage, to the man who should rid the land of this scourge. John's heart rose to the deed, and he offered himself for the service. The great haunt of the giants was a wood, and John set out with his old sword to perform his task. When he reached the wood he laid himself down to think what course he should follow, for he knew how weak he was compared to those he had undertaken to kill. He had not waited long when he saw them coming with a wagon to fetch wood for fuel. My, they were big ones, with huge heads, and long tusks for teeth. Johnny hid himself in the hollow of a tree, thinking only of his own safety. Feeling himself safe, he peeped out of his hiding-place and watched the two at work. Thus watching, he formed his plan of action. He picked up a pebble— threw it with force at one of them, and struck him a sharp blow on the head. The giant, in his pain, turned at once on his companion, and blamed him in strong words for hitting him. The other denied, in anger, that he had thrown the pebble. John now saw himself on the highway to gain his reward and the hand of the king's daughter. He kept still, and watched carefully for an opportunity of striking another blow. He soon found it, and right against the giant's head went another pebble. The injured giant fell on his companion in a fury, and the two belabored each other till they were utterly tired out. They sat down on a log to breathe, rest, and recover themselves. While sitting, one of them said, "'Well, all the king's army was not able to take us, but I fear an old woman with a rope's end would be too much for us now.' "'If that be so,' said Johnny Gloak, as he sprang, bold as a lion, from his hiding-place, "'what do you say to Johnny Gloak with his old rusty sword?' So saying, he fell upon them, cut off their heads, and returned in triumph. He received the king's daughter in marriage, and for a time lived in peace and happiness. He never told the mode he followed in his dealing with the giants.' Some time after, a rebellion broke out among the subjects of his father-in-law. John, on the strength of his former valiant deed, was chosen to quell the rebellion. His heart sank within him, but he could not refuse, and so lose his great name. He was mounted on the fiercest horse that ever saw sun or wind, and set out on his desperate task. He was not accustomed to ride on horseback, and he soon lost all control of his steed. It galloped off at full speed, in the direction of the rebel army. In its wild career it passed under the old gallows that stood by the wayside. The gallows was somewhat old and frail, and down it fell on the horse's neck. Still the horse made no stop, but always forward at furious speed towards the rebels, on seeing this strange sight approaching towards them at such a speed, they were seized with terror, and cried out to one another, "'There comes Johnny Gloak, that killed the two giants, with the gallows on his horse's neck to hang us all!' They broke their ranks, fled in dismay, and never stopped till they reached their homes. Thus was Johnny Gloak a second time victorious." So, in due time, he came to the throne, and lived a long, happy, and good life as king. End of Johnny Gloak Section 16 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs Coat o' Clay Once on a time in the parts of Lindsay there lived a wise woman. Some said she was a witch, but they said it in a whisper, lest she should overhear and do them a mischief. And truly it was not a thing one could be sure of, for she was never known to hurt any one, which, if she were a witch, she would have been sure to do. But she could tell you what your sickness was, and how to cure it with herbs, and she could mix rare possets that would drive the pain out of you in a twinkling, and she could advise you what to do if your cows were ill, or if you'd got into trouble, and tell the maids whether their sweethearts were likely to be faithful. But she was ill-pleased if folks questioned her too much or too long, and she sore misliked fools. A many came to her asking foolish things, as was their nature, and to them she never gave counsel, at least of a kind that could aid them much. Well, one day, as she sat at her door paring potatoes, over the stile and up the path came a tall lad with a long nose and goggle eyes and his hands in his pockets. "'That's a fool, if ever was one, and a fool's luck in his face,' said the wise woman to herself with a nod of her head, and threw a potato-skin over her left shoulder to keep off ill chance. "'Good day, missus,' said the fool. "'I be come to see thee.' "'So thou art,' said the wise woman. "'I see that. "'How's all in thy folk this year?' "'Oh, fairly,' answered he. "'But they say I be a fool.' "'Ay, so thou art,' nodded she, "'and threw away a bad potato. "'I see that, too. "'But what's to me? "'I keep no brains for sale.' "'Well, see now. "'Mother says I'll ne'er be wiser all my born days.' But folks tell us thou canst do everything. Can't teach me a bit, so they'll think me a clever fellow at home? How tout, said the wise woman, thou art a bigger fool than I thought. Nay, I can't teach thee naught, lad, but I tell thee summit. Thou'lt be a fool all thy days till thou gets a coat o' clay, and then thou'lt know more than me. Hi, missus, what sort of a coat's that? said he. "'That's none of my business,' answered she. "'Thou'st got to find out that.' And she took up her potatoes and went into her house. The fool took off his cap and scratched his head. "'It's a queer kind of coat to look for, surely,' said he. "'I never heard of a coat of clay. "'But then I be a fool. "'That's true.' So he walked on till he came to the drain nearby with just a pickle of water and a foot of mud in it. "'Here's muck,' said the fool, much pleased, and he got in and rolled in it, spluttering. hi yi said he, for he had his mouth full. "'I've got a coat o' clay now, to be sure. I'll go home and tell my mother I'm a wise man, and not a fool any longer.' And he went on home. Presently he came to a cottage with a lass at the door. "'Morning, fool,' said she. "'Hast thou been ducked in the horse-pond?' "'Fool yourself,' said he. "'The wise woman says I'll know more than she when I get a coat of clay, and here it is. Shall I marry thee, lass?' "'Aye,' said she, for she thought she'd like a fool for a husband. When shall it be?' "'I'll come and fetch thee when I've told my mother,' said the fool and he gave her his lucky penny and went on. When he got home, his mother was on the doorstep. "'Mother, I've got a coat o' clay,' said he. "'Coat o' muck,' said she, "'and what of that?' "'Wise woman said I'd know more than she "'when I got a coat o' clay,' said he. "'So I down in the drain and got one, "'and I'm not a fool any longer.' "'Very good,' said his mother. Now thou canst get a wife. Aye, said he, I'm going to marry so-and-so. What? said his mother. That lass? No, and that thou not. She's not but a brat, with ne'er a cow or a cabbage or her own. But I gave her my luck, Penny, said the fool. 
then thou art a bigger fool than ever for all thy coat o clay said his mother and banged the door in his face dang it said the fool and scratched his head that's not the right sort of clay surely so back he went to the high road and sat down on the bank of a river close by looking at the water which was cool and clear by and by he fell asleep and before he knew what he was about plump he rolled off into the river with a splash and scrambled out dripping like a drowned rat dear dear said he i'd better go and get dry in the sun so up he went to the high road and lay down in the dust rolling about so that the sun should get at him all over presently when he sat up and looked down at himself he found that the dust had caked into a sort of skin all over his wet clothes till you could not see an inch of them they were so well covered hi yi said he here's a coat of clay ready made and a fine one see now i'm a clever fellow this time surely for i found what i wanted without looking for it wow but it's a fine feeling to be so smart and he sat and scratched his head and thought about his own cleverness but all of a sudden round the corner came the squire on horseback full gallop as if the boggles were after him but the fool had to jump even though the squire pulled his horse back on his haunches what the dickens said the squire do you mean by lying in the middle of the road like that well master said the fool i fell into the water and got wet so i lay down the road to get dry and i lay down a fool and got up a wise man how's that said the squire so the fool told him about the wise woman and the coat of clay ah ha ha laughed the squire who ever heard of a wise man lying in the middle of the high road to be ridden over lad take my word for it you are a bigger fool than ever and he rode on laughing dang it said the fool as he scratched his head i've not got the right sort of coat yet then <coughs> and he choked and spluttered in the dust that the squire's horse had raised so he went on in a melancholy mood till he came to an inn and the landlord at his door smoking well fool said he thou art fine and dirty ay said the fool i be dirty outside and dusty in but it's not the right thing yet and he told the landlord all about the wise woman and the coat of clay how tout said the landlord with a wink i know what's wrong thou's got a skin o' dirt outside and all dry dust inside thou must moisten it lad with a good drink and then thou'lt have a real all over coat of clay hi said the fool that's a good word so down he sat and began to drink but it was wonderful how much liquor it took to moisten so much dust and each time he got to the bottom of the pot he found he was still dry at last he began to feel very merry and pleased with himself hi yi said he i've got a real coat of clay now outside and in what a difference it do make to be sure i feel another man now so smart and he told the landlord he was certainly a wise man now though he couldn't speak over distinctly after drinking so much so up he got and thought he would go home and tell his mother she hadn't a fool for a son any more but just as he was trying to get through the inn door which would scarcely keep still long enough for him to find it up came the landlord and caught him by the sleeve see here master said he thou hasn't paid for thy score where's thy money haven't any said the fool and pulled out his pockets to show they were empty what said the landlord and swore thou's drunk all my liquor and haven't got not to pay for it with hi said the fool you told me to drink so as to get a coat of clay but as i'm a wise man now i don't mind helping thee along in the world a bit for though i'm a smart fellow i'm not too proud to my friends wise man smart fellow said the landlord and help me along wilt thee dang it thou'rt the biggest fool i ever saw and it's i'll help thee first out o this and he kicked him out of the door into the road and swore at him 
hum said the fool as he lay in the dust i'm not so wise as i thought i guess i'll go back to the wise woman and tell her there's a screw loose somewhere so up he got and went along to her house and found her sitting at the door so thou art come back said she with a nod what dost thou want with me now so he sat down and told her how he tried to get a coat of clay and he wasn't any wiser for all of it no said the wise woman thou art a bigger fool than ever my lad so they all say sighed the fool but where can i get the right sort of coat of clay then missus when thou art done with this world and thy folk put thee in the ground said the wise woman that's the only coat of clay as'll make such as thee wise lad born a fool die a fool and be a fool thy life long and that's the truth and she went into her house and shut the door dang it said the fool i must tell my mother she was right after all and that she'll never have a wise man for a son and he went off home end of coat a clay section seventeen of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs The Three Cows There was a farmer, and he had three cows. Fine, fat beauties they were. One was called Facey, the other Diamond, and the third Beauty. One morning he went into his cowshed, and there he found Facey so thin that the wind would have blown her away. Her skin hung loose about her, all her flesh was gone, and she stared out of her great eyes as though she'd seen a ghost. And what was more, the fireplace in the kitchen was one great pile of wood ash. Well, he was bothered with it. He could not see how all this had come about. Next morning his wife went out to the shed, and see, Diamond was for all the world as wished a looking creature as Facey. Nothing but a bag of bones, all the flesh gone and half a rick of wood was gone too, but the fireplace was piled up three feet high with white wood ashes. The farmer determined to watch the third night, so he hid in a closet which opened out of the parlor, and he left the door just ajar, that he might see what passed. Tick, tick went the clock, and the farmer was nearly tired of waiting. He had to bite his little finger to keep himself awake, when suddenly, the door of his house flew open, and in rushed maybe a thousand pixies, laughing and dancing, and dragging at Beauty's halter, till they had brought the cow into the middle of the room. The farmer really thought he should have died with fright, and so perhaps he would, had not curiosity kept him alive. Tick, tick, went the clock, but he did not hear it now. He was too intent staring at the pixies and his last beautiful cow. He saw them throw her down fall on her, and kill her. Then with their knives they ripped her open, and flayed her clean as a whistle. Then out ran some of the little people, and brought in firewood, and made a roaring blaze on the hearth. And there they cooked the flesh of the cow. They baked, and they boiled, they stewed, and they fried. "'Take care!' cried one, who seemed to be the king. "'Let no bone be broken!' Well, when they had all eaten, and had devoured every scrap of beef on the cow, they began playing games with the bones, tossing them one to another. One little leg-bone fell close to the closet door, and the farmer was so afraid lest the pixies should come there and find him in their search for the bone, that he put out his hand and drew it into him. Then he saw the king stand on the table and say, "'Gather the bones!' Round and round flew the imps, picking up the bones. "'Arrange them,' said the king, and they placed them all in their proper positions in the hide of the cow. Then they folded the skin over them, and the king struck the heap of bone and skin with his rod. Whished! Up sprang the cow, and lo, dismally, it was alive again. But, alas, as the pixies dragged it back to its stall, it halted in the off forefoot, 
for a bone was missing. The cock crew, away they flew, and the farmer crept trembling to bed. End of the Three Cows Section 18 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Edward Dumas, El Dorado, Arkansas. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs The Blinded Giant At Dalton, near Thirsk, in Yorkshire, there is a mill. It has quite recently been rebuilt, but when I was at Dalton six years ago, the old building stood. In front of the house was a long mound, which went by the name of the Giant's Grave, and in the mill you can see a long blade of iron, something like a scythe blade, but not curved, which was called the Giant's Knife, because of a very curious story which is told of this knife. Would you like to hear it? Well, it isn't very long. There once lived a giant at this mill who had only one eye in the middle of his forehead, and he ground men's bones to make his bread. One day he captured on Pilmore a lad named Jack, and instead of grinding him in the mill, he kept him grinding as his servant, and never let him get away. Jack served the giant seven years, and never was allowed a holiday the whole time. At last he could bear it no longer. Top Cliff Fair was coming on and Jack begged that he might be allowed to go there. No, no, said the giant. Stop at home, and mind your grinding. I've been grinding and grinding these seven years, said Jack, and not a holiday have I had. I'll have one now, whatever you say. We'll see about that, said the giant. Well, the day was hot, and after dinner, the giant lay down in the mill with his head on a sack and dozed. He had been eating in the mill, and had laid down a great loaf of bone bread by his side, and the knife I told you about was in his hand. But his fingers relaxed their hold of it in sleep. Jack seized the knife, and holding it with both hands, drove the blade into the single eye of the giant, who woke with a howl of agony, and starting up, barred the door. Jack was again in difficulties, for he couldn't get out, but he soon found a way out of them. The giant had a favorite dog, which had also been sleeping when his master was blinded, so Jack killed the dog, skinned it, and threw the hide over his back. Bow wow, says Jack. At him, truncheon, said the giant. At the little wretch that I have fed these seven years, and now has blinded me. Bow wow says Jack, and ran between the giant's legs on all fours, barking till he got to the door. He unlatched it and was off, and never more was seen at Dalton Mill. End of The Blinded Giant Section 19 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shakira More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs Scrapefoot Once upon a time, there were three bears who lived in a castle in a great wood. One of them was a great big bear, and one was a middling bear, and one was a little bear. And in the same wood there was a fox who lived all alone. His name was Scrapefoot. Scrapefoot was very much afraid of the bears, but for all that he wanted very much to know all about them. And one day, as he went through the wood, he found himself near the bear's castle, and he wondered whether he could get into the castle. He looked all about him everywhere, and he could not see any one. So he came up very quietly, till at last he came up to the door of the castle, and he tried whether he could open it. Yes, the door was not locked, 
and he opened it just a little way and put his nose in and looked and he could not see any one so then he opened it a little way farther and put one paw in and then another paw and another and another and then he was all in the bear's castle he found he was in a great hall with three chairs in it one big one middling and one little chair and he thought he would like to sit down and rest and look about him so he sat down on the big chair but he found it so hard and uncomfortable that it made his bones ache and he jumped down at once and got into the middling chair and he turned round and round in it but he couldn't make himself comfortable so then he went to the little chair and sat down in it and it was so soft and warm and comfortable that scrapefoot was quite happy but all at once it broke to pieces under him and he couldn't put it together again so he got up and began to look about him again and on one table he saw three saucers of which one was very big one was middling and one was quite a little saucer scrapefoot was very thirsty and he began to drink out of the big saucer but he only just tasted the milk in the big saucer which was so sour and so nasty that he would not taste another drop of it then he tried the middling saucer and he drank a little of that he tried two or three mouthfuls but it was not nice and then he left it and went to the little saucer and the milk in the little saucer was so sweet and so nice that he went on drinking it till it was all gone then scrapefoot thought he would like to go upstairs and he listened and he could not hear any one so upstairs he went and he found a great room with three beds in it one was a big bed and one was a middling bed and one was a little white bed and he climbed up into the big bed but it was so hard and lumpy and uncomfortable that he jumped down again at once and tried the middling bed that was rather better but he could not get comfortably in it so after turning about a little while he got up and went to the little bed and that was so soft and so warm and so nice that he fell fast asleep at once and after a time the bears came home and when they got into the hall the big bear went to his chair and said who's been sitting in my chair and the middling bear said who's been sitting in my chair and the little bear said who's been sitting in my chair and has broken it all to pieces and then they went to have their milk and the big bear said who's been drinking my milk and the middling bear said who's been drinking my milk and the little bear said who's been drinking my milk and has drunk it all up then they went upstairs and into the bedroom and the big bear said who's been sleeping in my bed and the middling bear said who's been sleeping in my bed and the little bear said who's been sleeping in my bed and see here he is so then the bears came and wondered what they should do with him and the big bear said let's hang him and then the middling bear said let's drown him and then the little bear said let's throw him out of the window and then the bears took him to the window and the big bear took two legs on one side and the middling bear took two legs on the other side and they swung him backwards and forwards backwards and forwards and out of the window poor scrapefoot was so frightened and he thought every bone in his body must be broken but he got up and first shook one leg no that was not broken and then another and that was not broken and another and another and then he wagged his tail and found there were no bones broken 
so then he galloped off home as fast as he could go and never went near the bear's castle again end of scrapefoot recording by shakira section 20 of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs The Peddler of Swaffham In the old days, when London Bridge was lined with shops from one end to the other, and salmon swam under the arches, there lived at Swaffham in Norfolk a poor peddler. He'd much ado to make his living, trudging about with his pack at his back and his dog at his heels, and at the close of the day's labour was but too glad to sit down and sleep. Now it fell out that one night he dreamed a dream, and therein he saw the great bridge of London town, and it sounded in his ears that if he went there he should hear joyful news he made little count of the dream but on the following night it came back to him and again on the third night then he said within himself i must needs try the issue of it and so he trudged up to london town long was the way and right glad was he when he stood on the great bridge and saw the tall houses on right hand and left and had glimpses of the water running and the ships sailing by all day long he paced to and fro but he heard nothing that might yield him comfort and again on the morrow he stood and he gazed he paced afresh the length of London Bridge, and naught did he see, and naught did he hear. Now the third day being come, as he still stood and gazed, a shopkeeper hard by spoke to him. Friend, said he, I wonder much at your fruitless standing. Have you no wares to sell? No, indeed, quoth the peddler and you do not beg for alms not so long as i can keep myself then what i pray thee dost thou want here and what may thy business be well kind sir to tell the truth i dreamed that if i came hither i should hear good news <laughs> right heartily did the shopkeeper laugh nay thou must be a fool to take a journey on such a silly errand i'll tell thee poor silly country fellow that i myself dreamed two a-nights and that last night i dreamt myself to be in swaffham a place clean unknown to me but in norfolk if i mistake not and methought i was in an orchard behind a peddler's house and in that orchard was a great oak tree then me seemed that if i digged i should find beneath that tree a great treasure but think you i am such a fool as to take on me a long and wearisome journey and all for a silly dream no my good fellow learn wit from a wiser man than thyself get thee home and mind thy business when the peddler heard this he spoke no word but was exceedingly glad in himself, and returning home, speedily digged underneath the great oak tree, and found a prodigious great treasure. He grew exceeding rich, but he did not forget his duty in the pride of his riches, for he built up again the church at Swaffham, and when he died, they put a statue of him therein, all in stone, with his pack at his back, and his dog at his heels. And there it stands to this day, to witness if I lie. End of the Peddler of Swaffham Recording by Steve Chilvers, 
Norwich, England. Section 21 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Old Witch. Once upon a time, there were two girls who lived with their mother and father. Their father had no work and the girls wanted to go away and seek their fortunes. Now one girl wanted to go to service, and her mother said that she might if she could find a place, so she started for the town. Well, she went all about the town, but no one wanted a girl like her. So she went on farther into the country, and she came to the place where there was an oven where there was lots of bread baking. And the bread said, "'Little girl, little girl, take us out!' We've been baking seven years, and no one has come to take us out. So the girl took out the bread, laid it on the ground, and went on her way. Then she met a cow, and the cow said, Little girl, little girl, milk me, milk me. Seven years I've been waiting, and no one has come to milk me. The little girl milked the cow into the pails that stood by. As she was thirsty, she drank some, and left the rest in the pails by the cow. Then she went on a little bit farther, and came to an apple tree, so loaded with fruit that its branches were breaking down, and the tree said, Little girl, little girl, help me shake my fruit. My branches are breaking, it's so heavy. And the girl said, Of course I will, you poor tree. So she took the fruit all off, propped the branches, and left the fruit on the ground under the tree. Then she went on again until she came to a house. Now in this house lived a witch, and this witch took girls into her house as servants. And when she heard that this girl had left her home to seek service, she said that she would try her and give her good wages. The witch told the girl what work she was to do. You must keep my house clean and tidy, sweep the floor and the fireplaces. But there is one thing you must never do. You must never look up the chimney or something bad will befall you. So the girl promised to do as she was told. But one morning, as she was cleaning, and the witch was out, she forgot what the witch said, and looked up the chimney. When she did, this great bag of money fell down in her lap. This happened again and again, so the girl started to go off home. When she had gone some way, she heard the witch coming after her, so she ran to the apple tree and cried, "'Apple tree, apple tree, hide me, so the old witch can't find me. If she does, she'll break my bones and bury me under the marble stones. So the apple tree hid her when the witch came up and said, Tree of mine, tree of mine, have you seen a girl with a willy-willy wag and a long-tailed bag who stole my money, all I had? And the apple tree said, No, mother, not for seven year. When the witch had gone down another way, the girl went on again, and just as she got to the cow, heard the witch coming after her again. So she ran to the cow and cried, Cow, cow, hide me, so the old witch can't find me. If she does, she'll pick my bones and bury me under the marble stones. So the cow hid her. When the old witch came up, she looked about and said to the cow, Cow of mine, cow of mine, have you seen a girl with a willy-willy wag and a long-tailed bag who stole my money, all I had? And the cow said, no, mother, not for seven years. When the witch had gone off another way, the little girl went out again, and when she was near the oven, she heard the witch coming after her again. So she ran to the oven and cried, Oven, oven, hide me, so the old witch can't find me. If she does, she'll break my bones and bury me under the marble stones. And the oven said, I've no room, ask the baker. And the baker hid her behind the oven. When the witch came up, she looked here and there and everywhere, and said to the baker, Man of mine, man of mine, have you seen a girl, with a willy-willy wag and a long-tailed bag, who stole my money, all I had? So the baker said, Look in the oven. And the old witch went to look, and the oven said, Get in and look in the furthest corner. 
and the witch did so. When she was inside, the oven shut her door, and the witch was kept there for a very long time. The girl went off again and reached her home with her many bags, married the rich man, and lived happy ever afterwards. The other sister then thought she would go and do the same, and she went the same way. But when she reached the oven, and the bread said, "'Little girl, little girl, take us out. Seven years we've been baking, and no one has come to take us.' The girl said, "'No, I do not want to burn my fingers.' So she went on till she met the cow, and the cow said, "'Little girl, little girl, milk me, milk me, do. Seven years I've been waiting, and no one has come to milk me.' But the girl said, "'No, I can't milk you, I'm in a hurry.' and went on faster. Then she came to the apple tree, and the apple tree asked her to help shake up the fruit. No, I can't. Another day, perhaps I may, and went on till she came to the witch's house. Well, it happened to her just the same as the other girl. She forgot what she was told, and one day when the witch was out, looked up the chimney, and down fell a bag of many. Well, she thought she'd be off at once. When she reached the apple tree, she heard the witch coming after her, and she cried, Apple tree, apple tree, hide me, so the old witch can't find me. If she does, she'll break my bones and bury me under the marble stones. But the tree didn't answer, and she ran on further. Presently the witch came up and said, Tree of mine, tree of mine, have you seen a girl with a willy-willy wag and a long-tailed bag who stole my money, all I had? And the tree said, Yes, mother, she's gone down that way. So the old witch went after him and caught her. She took all the money away from her, beat her, and sent her off home just as she was. End of The Old Witch Section 22 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lydia. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Three Wishes Once upon a time, and be sure it was a long time ago, there lived a poor woodman in a great forest, and every day of his life he went out to fell timber. So one day he started out, and the good wife filled his wallet and slung his bottle on his back, that he might have meat and drink in the forest. He had marked out a huge old oak, which, thought he, would furnish many and many a good plank. And when he was come to it, he took his axe in his hand and swung it round his head, as though he were minded to fell the tree at one stroke. But he hadn't give one blow, when, what should he hear but the pitifullest entreating? And there stood before him a fairy who prayed and beseeched him to spare the tree. He was dazed, as you may fancy, with wonderment and affright, and he couldn't open his mouth to utter a word. But he found his tongue at last, and, well, said he, I'll lean do as thou wishest. You've done better for yourself than you know answered the fairy, and to show I'm not ungrateful, I'll grant you your next three wishes, be they what they may. And therewith the fairy was no more to be seen, and the woodman slung his wallet over his shoulder and his bottle at his side, and off he started home. But the way was long, and the poor man was regularly dazed with the wonderful thing that had befallen him, and when he got home there was nothing in his noddle but the wish to sit down and rest. Maybe, too, t'was a trick of the fairies. Who can tell? Anyhow, he sat down by the blazing fire, and as he sat he waxed hungry, though it was a long way off supper-time yet. "'Hasn't thou not for supper, dame?' said he to his wife. "'Nay, not for a couple hours yet,' said she. "'Ah,' groaned the woodsman, "'I wish I had a good link of black pudding here before me.' No sooner had he said the word, when clatter, clatter, rustle, rustle, what should come down the chimney but a link of the finest black pudding the heart of a man could wish for? If the woodman stared, the good wife stared three times as much. "'What's all this?' says she. Then all the morning's work came back to the woodman, and he told his tale right out from beginning to end. And as he told it, the good wife glowered and glowered, and when he had made an end of it, she burst out, "'Thou beest but a fool, Jan, thou beest but a fool, and I wish the pudding were at the end of thy nose. I do indeed.' And before you could say Jack Robinson, there the goodman sat, and his nose was the longer for a noble link of black pudding. He gave a pull, but it stuck, and she gave a pull, but it stuck, and they both pulled till they had nigh pulled the nose off, but it stuck and stuck. What's to be done now? said he. Tisn't so very unsightly, says she, looking hard at him. 
Then the woodman saw that if he wished, he must need wish in a hurry, and wish he did, that the black pudding might come off his nose. Well, there it lay in a dish on the table, and the goodman and goodwife didn't ride in a golden coach, or dress in silk and satin. Why, they had at least as fine a black pudding for their supper as the heart of man could desire. End of the Three Wishes Section 23 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Douglas Taylor, Port Townsend, Washington. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs The Buried Moon Long ago, in my grandmother's time, the Carland was all in bogs, great pools of black water and creeping trickles of green water, and squishy mools which squirted when you stepped on them. Well, Granny used to say how long before her time the moon herself was once dead and buried in the marshes, and as she used to tell me, I'll tell you all about it. The moon up yonder shone and shone, just as she does now, and when she shone she lighted up the bog pools so that one could walk about almost as safe as in the day. But when she didn't shine, out came the things that dwelt in the darkness and went about seeking to do evil and harm. Boggles and crawling horrors all came out when the moon didn't shine. Well, the moon heard of this, and, being kind and good, as she surely is, shining for us in the night instead of taking her natural rest, she was main troubled. "'I'll see for myself, I will,' said she. "'Maybe it's not so bad as folks make out.' Sure enough, at the month's end, down she stepped, wrapped up in a black cloak and a black hood over her yellow shining hair. Straight she went to the bog edge and looked about her. Water here and water there, waving tussocks and trembling mules, and great black snags all twisted and bent. Before her all was dark, dark but for the glimmer of the stars in the pools and the light that came from her own white feet stealing out of her black cloak. The moon drew her cloak faster about and trembled, but she wouldn't go back without seeing all there was to be seen. So on she went, stepping as light as the wind in summer from tuft to tuft between the greedy gurgling water-holes. Just as she came near a big black pool, her foot slipped, and she was nigh tumbling in. She grabbed with both hands at a snag nearby to steady herself with, but as she touched it, it twined itself round her wrists like a pair of handcuffs and gripped her so that she couldn't move. She pulled and twisted and fought, but it was no good. She was fast and must stay fast. Presently, as she stood trembling in the dark, wondering if help would come, she heard something calling in the distance, calling calling and then dying away with a sob till the marshes were full of this pitiful crying sound then she heard steps floundering along squishing in the mud and slipping on the tufts and through the darkness she saw a white face with great feared eyes twas a man strayed in the bogs mazed with fear he struggled on toward the flickering light that looked like help and safety and when the poor moon saw that he was coming nigher and nigher to the deep hole, further and further from the path, she was so mad and so sorry that she struggled and fought and pulled harder than ever, and though she couldn't get loose, she twisted and turned till her black hood fell back off her shining yellow hair, and the beautiful light that came from it drove away the darkness. Oh, but the man cried with joy to see the light again and at once all evil things fled back into the dark corners, for they cannot abide the light. So he could see where he was, and where the path was, and how he could get out of the marsh, and he was in such haste to get away from the quicks and boggles and things that dwelt there, that he scarce looked at the brave light that came from the beautiful shining yellow hair streaming out over the black cloak and falling to the water at his feet. And the moon herself was so taken up with saving him, and with rejoicing that he was back on the right path, 
that she clean forgot that she needed help herself, and that she was held fast by the black snag. So off he went, spent and gasping, and stumbling and sobbing with joy, flying for his life out of the terrible bogs. Then he came over the moon. She would main like to go with him, so she pulled and fought as if she were mad, till she fell on her knees, spent with tugging at the foot of the snag. And as she lay there gasping for breath, the black hood fell forward over her head. So out went the blessed light, and back came the darkness, with all its evil things, with a screech and a howl. They came crowding round her, mocking and snatching and beating, shrieking with rage and spite, and swearing and snarling, for they knew her for their old enemy that drove them back into the corners and kept them from working their wicked wills. "'Drat thee!' yelled the witch-bodies. "'Thou'st spoiled our spells this year agone!' "'And dost thou sense to brood in the corners?' howled the boggles. And all the things joined in with a great ho-ho, till the very tussocks shook and the water gurgled, and they began again. "'We'll poison her!' "'Poison her!' shrieked the witches, and— Ho, ho, howled the things again. We'll smother her, smother her, whispered the crawling horrors, and twined themselves round her knees. And ho, ho, mocked the rest of them. And again they all shouted with spite and ill will. And the poor moon crouched down and wished she was dead and done with. And they fought and squabbled what they should do with her, till a pale gray light began to come in the sky, and it drew nigh the dawning, and when they saw that, they were feared lest they shouldn't have time to work their will, and they caught hold of her with horrid bony fingers, and laid her deep in the water at the foot of the snag, and the boggles fetched a strange big stone, and rolled it on top of her, to keep her from rising, and they told two of the will o' the wikes to take turns in watching on the black snag, to see that she lay safe and still, and couldn't get out to spoil their sport. And there lay the poor moon, dead and buried in the bog, till someone would set her loose, and who'd know where to look for her? Well, the days passed, and twas the time for the new moon's coming, and the folk put pennies in their pockets and straws in their caps, so as to be ready for her, and looked about, for the moon was a good friend to the marsh folk, and they were main glad when the dark time was gone, and the paths were safe again, and the evil things were driven back by the blessed light into the darkness and the water-holes. But days and days passed, and the new moon never came, and the nights were aye dark, and the evil things were worse than ever, and still the days went on, and the new moon never came. Naturally, the poor folk were strangely feared and mazed, and a lot of them went to the wise woman who dwelt in the old mill, and asked if so be she could find out where the moon was gone. Well, said she, after looking in the brew pot and in the mirror and in the book, it be main queer, but I can't rightly tell ye what's happened to her. If ye hear of aught, come and tell me. So they went their ways, and as days went by, and never a moon came, naturally they talked. My word, I reckon they did talk. Their tongues wagged at home and at the inn and in the garth. But so came one day, as they sat on the great settle in the inn, a man from the far end of the boglands was smoking and listening, when all at once he sat up and slapped his knee. "'My facts,' says he, "'I'd clean forgot, but I reckon I kens where the moon be.' And he told them of how he was lost in the bogs, and how, when he was nigh dead with fright, the light shone out, and he found the path and got home safe. So off they all went to the wise woman and told her about it, and she looked long in the pot and the book again, and then she nodded her head. It's dark still, childer, 
dark says she and i can't rightly see but do as i tell ye and ye'll find out for yourselves go all of ye just afore the night gathers put a stone in your mouth and take a hazel twig in your hands and say never a word till you're safe home again then walk on and fear not far into the midst of the marsh till ye find a coffin a candle and a cross then ye'll not be far from your moon look and mappen ye'll find her so came the next night and the darklings out they went all together every man with a stone in his mouth and a hazel twig in his hand and feeling thou mayst reckon main feared and creepy and they stumbled and stottered along the paths into the midst of the bogs they saw not though they heard sighings and flutterings in their ears and felt cold wet fingers touching them but all at once looking around for the coffin the candle and the cross while they came nigh to the pool beside the great snag where the moon lay buried and all at once they stopped quaking and mazed and skeery for there was the great stone half in half out of the water for all the world like a strange big coffin and at the head was the black snag stretching out its two arms in a dark gruesome cross and on it a tiddy light flickered like a dying candle and they all knelt down in the mud and said our lord first forward because of the cross and then backward to keep off the boggles but without speaking out for they knew that the evil things would catch them if they didn't do as the wise woman told them then they went nigher and took hold of the big stone and shoved it up and afterwards they said that for one titty minute they saw a strange and beautiful face looking up at them glad light out of the black water but the light came so quick and so white and shining that they stepped back mazed with it and the very next minute when they could see again there was the full moon in the sky bright and beautiful and kind as ever shining and smiling down at them and making the bugs and the paths as clear as day and stealing into the very corners as though she'd have driven the darkness and the boggles clean away if she could. End of the Buried Moon Recording by Douglas Taylor Section 24 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. A Son of Adam. A man was one day working. It was very hot, and he was digging. By and by he stopped to rest and wipe his face and he was very angry to think he had to work so hard only because of Adam's sin. So he complained bitterly, and said some very hard words about Adam. It happened that his master heard him, and he asked, Why do you blame Adam? You'd have done just like Adam if you'd have been in his place. No, I shouldn't, said the man. I should have knowed better. "'Well, I'll try you,' says his master. "'Come to me at dinner-time.' So come dinner-time the man came, and his master took him into a room, where the table was a set with good things of all sorts, and he said, "'Now you can eat as much as ever you like from any of the dishes on this table, but don't touch the covered dish in the middle till I come back.' And with that the master went out of the room, and left the man there all by himself. So the man sat down, and helped himself, and ate some of this dish and some of that, and enjoyed himself finely. 
But after a while, as his master didn't come back, he began to look at the covered dish, and to wonder whatever was in it. And he wondered more and more, and he says to himself, It must be something very nice. Why shouldn't I just look at it? I won't touch it. There can't be any harm in just peeping. So at last he could hold back no longer, and he lifted up the cover a tiny bit, but he couldn't see anything. Then he lifted it up a bit more, and out popped a mouse. The man tried to catch it, but it ran away and jumped off the table, and he ran after it. It ran first into one corner, and then, just as he thought he'd got it, into another, and under the table, and all about the room. And the man made such a clatter, jumping and banging and running round after that mouse, a-trying to catch it, that at last his master came in. Ah, he said, never you blame Adam again, my man. End of A Son of Adam Section 25 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brad Philippone. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Children in the Wood. Now ponder well, you parents dear, these words which I shall write. A doleful story you shall hear in time brought forth to light. A gentleman of good account in Norfolk dwelt of late, who did in honour far surmount most men of his estate. Sore sick he was, and like to die, no help could his life save. His wife by him as sick did lie, and both possessed one grave. No love between these two was lost, each was to other kind. In love they lived, in love they died, and left two babes behind. The one a fine and pretty boy, not passing three years old, the other a girl more young than he, and framed in beauty's mould. The father left his little son as plainly did appear, when he to perfect age should come three hundred pound a year and to his little daughter jane five hundred pounds in gold to be paid down on marriage day which might not be controlled but if the children chanced to die ere they to age should come their uncle should possess their wealth for so the will did run now brother said the dying man look to my children dear be good unto my boy and girl no friends else have they here to God and you I recommend my children dear this day, but little while be sure we have within the world to stay. You must be father and mother both, and uncle all in one. God knows what will become of them when I am dead and gone. With that bespake their mother dear, O oh, brother kind, quoth she, you are the man must bring our babes to wealth or misery. And if you keep them carefully, then God will you reward. But if you otherwise should deal, God will your deeds regard. With lips as cold as any stone they kiss their children small. God bless you both, my children dear. With that the tears did fall. These speeches then their brother spake to this sick couple there. The keeping of your little one, sweet sister, do not fear. God never prosper me nor mine, nor aught else that I have, if I do wrong your children dear when you are laid in grave. The parents, being dead and gone, the children home he takes, and brings them straight unto his house where much of them he makes. He had not kept these pretty babes a twelvemonth and a day, but for their wealth he did devise to make them both away. He bargained with two ruffians strong, which were of furious mood, that they should take these children young and slay them in a wood. He told his wife an artful tale he would the children send to be brought up in London town with one that was his friend. Away then went those pretty babes rejoicing at that tide, rejoicing with a merry mind they should on cock-horse ride. They prate and prattle pleasantly as they ride on the way to those that should their butchers be and work their lives decay so that the pretty speech they had made murder's heart relent, and they that undertook the deed full sore now did repent. 
yet one of them more hard of heart did vow to do his charge because the wretch that hired him had paid him very large the other won't agree thereto so there they fall to strife with one another they did fight about the children's life and he that was of mildest mood did slay the other there within an unfrequented wood the babes did quake for fear he took the children by the hand tears standing in their eye and bade them straightway follow him and look they did not cry and two long miles he led them on while they for food complain stay here quoth he i'll bring you bread when i come back again these pretty babes with hand in hand went wandering up and down but never more could see the man approaching from the town their pretty lips with blackberries were all besmeared and dyed and when they saw the darksome night they sat them down and cried thus wandered these poor innocents till death did end their grief in one another's arms they died as wanting due relief no burial this pretty pair from any man receives till robin redbreast piously did cover them with leaves and now the heavy wrath of god upon their uncle fell yea fearful fiends did haunt his house his conscience felt an hell his barns were fired his goods consumed his lands were barren made his cattle died within the field and nothing with him stayed and in a voyage to portugal two of his sons did die and to conclude himself was brought to want and misery he pawned and mortgaged all his land ere seven years came about and now at last this wicked act did by this means come out the fellow that did take in hand these children for to kill was for a robbery judged to die such was god's blessed will who did confess the very truth as here hath been displayed the uncle having died in jail where he for debt was laid you that executors be made and overseers eke of children that be fatherless and infants mild and meek take you example by this thing and yield to each his right lest god with such like misery your wicked minds requite end of the children in the wood Section 26 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Douglas Taylor, Port Townsend, Washington. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Hobyes. Once there was an old man and woman and a little girl, and they all lived in a house made of hemp stalks. Now the old man had a little dog named Turpy, and one night the Hobyas came and said, Hobya, 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 tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. But little dog Turpy barked so that the Hobyas ran off. And the old man said, Little dog Turpy barks so that I cannot sleep nor slumber, and if I live till morning I will cut off his tail. So in the morning the old man cut off little dog Turpy's tail. The next night the Hobias came again and said, Hobia, 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 tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. But little dog Turpy barked so that the Hobias ran off. And the old man said, Little dog Turpy barks so that I cannot sleep nor slumber, and if I live till morning I will cut off one of his legs. So in the morning the old man cut off one of little dog Turpy's legs. The next night the Hobias came again and said, Hobia, 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 tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. But little dog Turpy barked, so that the Hobias ran off, and the old man said, Little dog Turpy barks, so that I cannot sleep nor slumber, and if I live till morning I will cut off another of his legs. So in the morning the old man cut off another of little dog Turpy's legs. The next night the Hobias came again and said, Hobia, 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 
tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. But little dog Turpy barked, so that the Hobias ran off, and the old man said, Little dog Turpy bark, so that I cannot sleep nor slumber, and if I live till morning I will cut off another of his legs. So in the morning the old man cut off another of little dog Turpy's legs. The next night the Hobias came again and said, Hobia, 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 tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. But little dog Turpy barked, so that the Hobias ran off. And the old man said, Little dog Turpy barks, so that I cannot sleep nor slumber, and if I live till morning I will cut off another of his legs. So in the morning the old man cut off another of little dog Turpy's legs. The next night the Hobias came again and said, Hobia, 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 tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. But little dog Turpy barked, so that the Hobias ran off, and the old man said, Little dog Turpy barks, so that I cannot sleep nor slumber, and if I live till morning I will cut off little dog Turpy's head. So, in the morning, the old man cut off little dog Turpy's head. The next night the Hobias came again and said, Hobia, 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 tear down the hemp stalks, eat up the old man and woman, and carry off the little girl. And when the Hobias found that little dog Turpy's head was off, they tore down the hemp stalks, ate up the old man and woman, and carried the little girl off in a bag. And when the Hobias came to their home, they hung up the bag with the little girl in it, and every Hobia knocked on the top of the bag and said, Look me, look me! And then they went to sleep until the next night, uh, for the Hobias slept in the daytime. The little girl cried a great deal, and a man with a big dog came that way and heard her crying. When he asked her how she came there, and she told him, he put the dog in the bag and took the little girl to his home. The next night, the Hobias took down the bag and knocked on the top of it and said, Look me, look me! And when they opened the bag, the big dog jumped out and ate them all up. So there are no Hobias now. End of The Hobias Recording by Douglas Taylor, Port Townsend, Washington Section 27 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. A Pottle of Brains. Once in these parts, and not so long gone neither, there was a fool that wanted to buy a pottle of brains, for he was ever getting into scrapes through his foolishness and being laughed at by every one. Folk told him that he could get everything he liked from the wise woman that lived on the top of the hill, and dealt in potions and herbs and spells and things, and could tell thee all as had come to thee or thy folk. So he told his mother, and asked her if he could seek the wise woman, and buy a pottle of brains. "'That ye should,' says she. "'Thou'st sore need of them, my son. And if I should die, who'd take care of a poor fool such as thou? No more fit to look after thyself than an unborn baby. But mind thy manners, and speak her pretty, my lad, for they wise folk are gay and light mispleased.' So off he went after his tea, and there she was, sitting by the fire and stirring a big pot. "'Good e'en, missus,' says he. "'It's a fine night.' "'Aye,' says she, and went on stirring. "'It'll maybe rain,' says he. 
and fidgeted from one foot t'other. "'Maybe,' says she. "'And mappin it won't,' says he, and looked out of the window. "Mappin," says she. And he scratched his head and twisted his hat. "'Well,' says he, "'I can't mind nothing else about the weather, but, uh, let me see, the crops are getting on fine.' "'Fine,' says she. "'And, and, the beasts is fattening,' says he. "'They are,' says she. "'And, and,' says he, and comes to a stop. "'I reckon we'll tackle business now, haven't done the polite like. "'Have you any brains for to sell?' "'That depends,' says she. "'If thou wants king's brains, or soldier's brains, or schoolmaster's brains, I dinna keep em. "'Hoot, no,' says he. "'Just ordinary brains, fit for any fool, same as every one has about here. "'Something clean common like.' "'Ay, so,' says the wise woman. "'I might manage that, if so be thou'lt help thyself.' "'How's that for, missus?' says he. "'Just so,' says she, looking in her pot. "'Bring me the heart of the thing thou likest best of all, "'and I'll tell thee where to get thy pottle o' brains.' "'But,' says he, scratching his head, "'how can I do that?' "'That's no for me to say,' says she. "'Find out for thyself, my lad, "'if thou doesn't want to be a fool all thy days.' "'but thou'lt have to read me a riddle, "'so as I can see thou'st brought the right thing, "'and if thy brains is about thee. "'And I've something else to see, too,' says she, "'so good e'en to thee.' "'And she carried the pot away with her into the back place. "'So off went the fool to his mother, "'and told her what the wise woman said. "'And I reckon I'll have to kill that pig,' says he, "'for I like fat bacon better than anything.' "'Then do it, my lad,' said his mother, "'for certain twill be a strange and good thing for thee, "'if thou canst buy a pottle of brains "'and be able to look after thine own self.' "'So he killed his pig, "'and next day off he went to the wise woman's cottage, "'and there she sat, reading in a great book. "'Good e'en, missus,' says he. "'I've brought thee the heart of the thing I like best of all.' "'and I put it happed in paper on the table.' "'Aye, so,' says she, and looked at him through her spectacles. "'Tell me this, then. What runs without feet?' "'He scratched his head, and thought, and thought, but he couldn't tell. "'Go thy ways,' says she. "'Thou'st not fetched me the right thing yet. I've no brains for thee to-day.' and she clapped the book together and turned her back. So off the fool went to tell his mother, but as he got nigh the house, out came folk running to tell him that his mother was dying. And when he got in, his mother only looked at him and smiled, as if to say she could leave him with a quiet mind, since he had got brains enough now to look after himself. And then she died. So down he sat, and the more he thought about it, the badder he felt. He minded how she had nursed him when he was a tiddy brat, and helped him with his lessons, and cooked his dinners, and mended his clothes, and bore with his foolishness, and he felt sorrier and sorrier, while he began to sob and greet. "'Oh, mother, mother,' says he, "'who'll take care of me now?' Thou shouldn't have left me alone, for I liked thee better than everything. And as he said that, he thought of the words of the wise woman. Hi, yi, says he, must I take mother's heart to her? No, I can't do that, says he. What'll I do, what'll I do to get that pottle of brains, now I'm alone in the world? So he thought, and thought, and thought, and next day he went and borrowed a sack, 
and bundled his mother in, and carried it on his shoulder up to the wise woman's cottage. "'Good e'en, miss,' says he. "'I reckon I've fetched thee the right thing this time, surely.' And he plumped the sack down, kerflop, in the door-sill. "'Maybe,' says the wise woman. "'But read me this now. "'What's yellow and shining but isn't gold?' And he scratched his head, and thought, and thought, but he couldn't tell. "'Thou'st not hit the right thing, my lad,' says she. "'I doubt thou'rt a bigger fool than I thought,' and shut the door in his face. "'See there,' says he, and sat down by the roadside and greets. "'I've lost the only two things as I cared for, and what else can I find to buy a pottle of brains with?' And he fair howled, till the tears ran down into his mouth. And up come a lass that lived near at hand, and looked at him. "'What's up with thee, fool?' says she. "'Oh, I've killed my pig, and lost my mother, and I'm no but a fool myself,' says he, sobbing. "'That's bad,' says she. "'And haven't thee anybody to look after thee?' "'No,' says he, "'and I cannot buy my pottle of brains, "'for there's nothing I like best left.' "'What art talking about?' says she. "'And down she sets by him, "'and he told her all about the wise woman and the pig "'and his mother and the riddles, "'and that he was alone in the world. "'Well,' says she, "'I wouldn't mind looking after thee myself.' "'Could thee do it?' says he. "'Oh, aye,' says she. "'Folks say as fools make good husbands, "'and I reckon I'll have thee, if thou art willing.' "'Canst cook?' says he. "'Aye, I can,' says she. "'And scrub?' says he. "'Surely,' says she. "'And mend my clothes?' says he. "'I can that,' says she. Oh, "'I reckon thou'lt do then as well as anybody,' says he. "'But what'll I do about this wise woman?' "'Oh, wait a bit,' says she. "'Something may turn up, "'and it'll not matter if thou art a fool "'so long as thou's got me to look after thee.' "'That's true,' says he. "'And off they went, and got married.' And she kept his house so clean and neat, and cooked his dinner so fine, that one night he says to her, "'Lass, I'm thinkin' I like thee best of everything after all.' "'That's good hearing,' says she. "'And what then?' "'Have I got to kill thee, dost think, and take thy heart up to the wise woman, for that pottle o' brains?' "'Law, no!' says she, looking scared. I will not have that. But see here, thou didn't cut out thy mother's heart, did thou? No, but if I had, maybe I'd have got my pottle of brains, says he. Not a bit of it, says she. Just thou take me as I be, heart and all, and I'll wager I'll help thee read the riddles. Oh, can thee so? says he, doubtful like. I reckon they're too hard for women folk. Well, says she, let's see now. Tell me the first. What runs without feet? says he. Why, water, says she. It do, says he, and scratched his head. And what's yellow and shining but isn't gold why the sun says she faith it be says he come we'll go up to the wise woman at once and off they went and as they came up the pad she was sitting at the door twining straws good e'en missus says he good e'en fool says she "'I reckon I've fetched thee the right thing at last,' says he. 
the wise woman looked at them both and wiped her spectacles canst tell me what it is that has first no legs and then two legs and ends with four legs and the fool scratched his head and thought and thought but he couldn't tell and the lass whispered in his ear it's a tadpole mappin says he then it may be a tadpole missis the wise woman nodded her head that's right says she and thou'st got thy pottle o' brains already Ooh, where be they says he looking about and feeling in his pockets in thy wife's head says she the only cure for a fool is a good wife to look after him and that thou'st got so good e'en to thee and with that she nodded to them and up and into the house so they went home together and he never wanted to buy a pottle of brains again for his wife had enough for both end of a pottle of brains section twenty eight of more english fairy tales the king of england and his three sons this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs the king of england and his three sons once upon a time there was an old king who had three sons and the old king fell very sick one time and there was nothing at all could make him well but some golden apples from a far country so the three brothers went on horseback to look for some of these apples they set off together and when they came to crossroads they halted and refreshed themselves a bit and then they agreed to meet on a certain time and not one was to go home before the other so valentine took the right and oliver went straight on and poor jack took the left to make my long story short i shall follow poor jack and let the other two take their chance for i don't think there was much good in them off poor jack rides over hills dales valleys and mountains through woolly woods and sheep walks where the old chap never sounded his hollow bugle horn farther than i can tell you to-night or ever intend to tell you at last he came to an old house near a great forest and there was an old man sitting out by the door and his look was enough to frighten you or any one else and the old man said to him good morning my king's son good morning to you old gentleman was the young prince's answer frightened out of his wits though he was he didn't like to give in the old gentleman told him to dismount and go in to have some refreshment and to put his horse in the stable such as it was jack soon felt much better after having something to eat and began to ask the old gentleman how he knew he was a king's son oh dear said the old man i knew that you were a king's son and i know what is your business better than what you do yourself so you will have to stay here to-night and when you are in bed you mustn't be frightened whatever you may hear there will come all manner of frogs and snakes and some will try to get into your eyes and your mouth but mind don't stir the least bit or you will turn into one of those things yourself poor jack didn't know what to make of this but however he ventured to go to bed just as he thought to have a bit of sleep round and over and under him they came but he never stirred an inch all night well my young son how are you this morning oh i am very well thank you but i didn't have much rest well never mind that you have got on very well so far but you have a great deal to go through before you can have the golden apples to go to your father you'd better come and have some breakfast before you start on your way to my other brother's house you will have to leave your own horse here with me until you come back again and tell me everything about how you get on after that out came a fresh horse for the young prince and the old man gave him a ball of yarn and he flung it between the horse's two ears off he went as fast as the wind which the wind behind could not catch the wind before 
until he came to the second oldest brother's house when he rode up to the door he had the same salute as from the first old man but this one was even uglier than the first one he had long grey hair and his teeth were curling out of his mouth and his finger and toenails had not been cut for many thousand years he put the horse into a much better stable and called jack in and gave him plenty to eat and drink and they had a bit of a chat before they went to bed well my young son said the old man i suppose you are one of the king's children come to look for the golden apples to bring him back to health yes i am the youngest of the three brothers and i should like to get them to go back with well don't mind my young son before you go to bed to-night i will send to my eldest brother and will tell him what you want and he won't have much trouble in sending you on to the place where you must get the apples but mind not to stir to-night no matter how you get bitten and stung or else you will work great mischief to yourself the young man went to bed and bore all as he did the first night and got up the next morning well and hearty after a good breakfast out comes a fresh horse and a ball of yarn to throw between his ears the old man told him to jump up quick and said that he had made it all right with his eldest brother not to delay for anything whatever for said he you have a good deal to go through within a very short and quick time he flung the ball and off he goes as quick as lightning and comes to the eldest brother's house the old man receives him very kindly and told him he long wished to see him and that he would go through his work like a man and come back safe and sound to-night said he i will give you rest there shall nothing come to disturb you so that you may not feel sleepy for to-morrow and you must mind to get up middling early for you've got to go and come all in the same day there will be no place for you to rest within thousands of miles of that place and if there was you would stand in great danger never to come from there in your own form now my young prince mind what i tell you to-morrow when you come in sight of a very large castle which will be surrounded with black water the first thing you will do you will tie your horse to a tree and you will see three beautiful swans in sight and you will say swan swan carry me over in the name of the griffin of the greenwood and the swans will swim you over to the earth there will be three great entrances the first guarded by four great giants with drawn swords in their hands the second by lions the other by fiery serpents and dragons you will have to be there exactly at one o'clock and mind and leave there precisely at two and not a moment later when the swans carry you over to the castle you will pass all these things all fast asleep but you must not notice any of them when you go in you will turn up to the right you will see some grand rooms then you will go downstairs through the cooking kitchen and through a door on your left you go into a garden where you will find the apples you want for your father to get well after you fill your wallet you make all speed you possibly can call out for the swans to carry you over the same as before after you get on your horse should you hear anything shouting or making any noise after you be sure not to look back as they will follow you for thousands of miles but when the time is up and you get near my place it will be all over well now my young man i have told you all you have to do to-morrow and mind whatever you do don't look about you when you see all those frightful things asleep keep a good heart and make haste from there and come back to me with all the speed you can i should like to know how my true brothers were when you left them and what they said to you about me well to tell the truth before i left london my father was sick and said i was to come here to look for the golden apples for they were the only things that would do him good and when i came to your youngest brother he told me many things i had to do before i came here and i thought once your youngest brother put me in the wrong bed when he put all those snakes to bite me all night long until your second brother told me so it was to be and said it's the same here but said you had none in your beds 
well let's go to bed you need not fear there are no snakes here the young man went to bed and had a good night's rest and got up the next morning as fresh as newly caught trout breakfast being over out comes the other horse and while saddling and fettling the old man began to laugh and told the young gentleman that if he saw a pretty young lady not to stay with her too long because she might waken and then he would have to stay with her or be turned into one of those unearthly monsters like those he would have to pass by going into the castle ha 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 you make me laugh so that i can scarcely buckle the saddle straps i think i shall make it all right my uncle if i see a young lady there you may depend well my boy i shall see how you get on so he mounts his arab steed and off he goes like a shot of a gun at last he comes in sight of the castle he ties his horse safe to a tree and pulls out his watch it was then a quarter to one when he called out swan swan carry me over for the name of the old griffin of the greenwood no sooner said than done a swan under each side and one in front took him over in a crack he got on his legs and walked quietly by all those giants lions fiery serpents and all manner of other frightful things too numerous to mention while they were fast asleep and that only for the space of one hour when into the castle he goes neck or nothing turning to the right upstairs he runs and enters into a very grand bedroom and sees a beautiful princess lying full stretch on a gold bedstead fast asleep he gazed on her beautiful form with admiration and he takes her garter off and buckles it on his own leg and he buckles his on hers he also takes a gold watch and pocket handkerchief and exchanges his for hers after that he ventures to give her a kiss when she very nearly opened her eyes seeing the time short off he runs downstairs and passing through the kitchen to go into the garden for the apples he could see the cook all fours on her back on the middle of the floor with a knife in one hand and the fork in the other he found the apples and filled the wallet and on passing through the kitchen the cook near wakened but he was obliged to make all the speed he possibly could as the time was nearly up he called out for the swans and they managed to take him over but they found that he was a little heavier than before no sooner had he mounted his horse he could hear a tremendous noise the enchantment was broke and they tried to follow him but all to no purpose he was not long before he came to the oldest brother's house and glad enough he was to see it for the sight and the noise of all those things that were after him nearly frightened him to death welcome my boy i am proud to see you dismount and put the horse in the stable and come in and have some refreshments i know you are hungry after all you have gone through in that castle and tell me all you did and all you saw there other king's sons went by here to go to that castle but they never came back alive and you are the only one that ever broke the spell and now you must come with me with a sword in your hand and must cut my head off and must throw it in the well the young prince dismounts and puts his horse in the stable and they go in to have some refreshments for i can assure you he wanted some and after telling everything that passed which the old gentleman was very pleased to hear they both went for a walk together the young prince looking around and seeing the place looking dreadful as did the old man he could scarcely walk from his toenails curling up like ram's horns that had not been cut for many hundred years and big long hair they came to a well and the old man gives the prince a sword and tells him to cut his head off and throw it in that well the young man has to do it against his wish but has to do it no sooner has he flung the head in the well than up springs one of the finest young gentlemen you would wish to see and instead of the old house and the frightful looking place it was changed into a beautiful hall and grounds and they went back and enjoyed themselves well and had a good laugh about the castle 
the young prince leaves this young gentleman in all his glory and he tells the young prince before leaving that he will see him again before long they have a jolly shake hands and off he goes to the next oldest brother and to make my long story short he has to serve the other two brothers the same as the first now the youngest brother began to ask him how things went on did you see my two brothers yes how did they look oh they looked very well i liked them much they told me many things what to do well did you go to the castle yes my uncle and will you tell me what you see in there did you see the young lady yes i saw her and plenty of other frightful things did you hear any snake biting you in my oldest brother's bed no there were none there i slept well you won't have to sleep in the same bed tonight you will have to cut my head off in the morning the young prince had a good night's rest and changed all the appearance of the place by cutting his friend's head off before he started in the morning a jolly shake hands and the uncle tells him it's very probable he shall see him again soon when he is not aware of it this one's mansion was very pretty and the country around it beautiful after his head was cut off off jack goes over hills dales valleys and mountains and very near losing his apples again at last he arrives at the crossroads where he has to meet his brothers on the very day appointed coming up to the place he sees no tracks of horses and being very tired he lays himself down to sleep by tying the horse to his leg and putting the apples under his bed presently up come the other brothers the same time to the minute and found him fast asleep and they would not waken him but said one to another let us see what sort of apples he has got under his head so they took and tasted them and found they were different to theirs they took and changed his apples for theirs and off to london as fast as they could and left the poor fellow sleeping after a while he awoke and seeing the tracks of other horses he mounted and off with him not thinking anything about the apples being changed he still had a long way to go and by the time he got near london he could hear all the bells in the town ringing but did not know what was the matter till he rode up to the palace when he came to know that his father was recovered by his brother's apples when he got there his two brothers were off to some sports for a while and the king was glad to see his youngest son and very anxious to taste his apples but when he found out that they were not good and thought they were more for poisoning him he sent immediately for the headsman to behead his youngest son who was taken away there and then in a carriage but instead of the headsman taking his head off he took him to a forest not far from the town because he had pity on him and there left him to take his chance when presently up comes a big hairy bear limping upon three legs the prince poor fellow climbed up a tree frightened of him but the bear told him to come down that it was no use of him to stop there with hard persuasion poor jack comes down and the bear speaks to him and bids him come here to me i will not do you any harm it's better for you to come with me and have some refreshments i know that you are hungry all this time the poor young prince says no i am not hungry but i was very frightened when i saw you coming to me first and i had no place to run away from you the bear said i was also afraid of you when i saw that gentleman setting you down from the carriage i thought you would have guns with you and that you would not mind killing me if you saw me but when i saw the gentleman going away with the carriage and leaving you behind by yourself i made bold to come to you to see who you were and now i know who you are very well are you not the king's youngest son i have seen you and your brothers and lots of other gentlemen in this wood many times now before we go from here i must tell you that i am in disguise and i shall take you where we are stopping the young prince tells him everything from first to last how he started in search of the apples and about the three old men and about the castle and how he was served at last by his father after he came home and instead of the headsman taking his head off he was kind enough to leave him his life and here i am now under your protection the bear tells him come on my brother 
there shall no harm come to you as long as you are with me so he takes him up to the tents and when they see him coming the girls begin to laugh and say here is our jubal coming with a young gentleman when he advanced nearer the tents they all knew that he was the young prince that had passed by that way many times before and when jubal went to change himself he called most of them together into one tent and told them all about him and to be kind to him and so they were for there was nothing that he desired but what he had the same as if he was in the palace with his father and mother jubal after he pulled off his hairy coat was one of the finest young men amongst them and he was the young prince's closest companion the young prince was always very sociable and merry only when he thought of the gold watch he had from the young princess in the castle and which he had lost he knew not where he passed off many days in the forest but one day he and poor jubal were strolling through the trees when they came to the very spot where they first met and accidentally looking up he could see his watch hanging in the tree which he had to climb when he first saw poor jubal coming to him in the form of a bear and he cries out jubal jubal i can see my watch up in that tree well i am sure how lucky exclaimed poor jubal shall i go and get it down no i'd rather go myself said the young prince now whilst all this was going on the young princess in that castle seeing that one of the king of england's sons had been there by the changing of the watch and other things got herself ready with a large army and sailed off for england she left her army a little out of the town and she went with her guards straight up to the palace to see the king and also demanded to see his sons they had long conversations together about different things at last she demands one of the sons to come before her and the oldest comes when she asks him have you ever been at the castle of melvales and he answers yes she throws down a pocket handkerchief and bids him to walk over it without stumbling he goes to walk over it and no sooner did he put his foot on it than he fell down and broke his leg he was taken off immediately and made a prisoner of by her own guards the other was called upon and was asked the same questions and i had to go through the same performance and he also was made a prisoner of now she says have you not another son when the king began so to shiver and shake and knock his two knees together that he could scarcely stand upon his legs and did not know what to say to her he was so much frightened at last a thought came to him to send for his headsman and inquired of him particularly did he behead his son or was he alive he is saved o king then bring him here immediately or i shall be done for two of the fastest horses they had were put in the carriage to go and look for the poor prince and when they got to the very spot where they had left him it was the time when the prince was up the tree getting his watch down and poor jubal standing a distance off they cried out to him had he seen another young man in this wood jubal seeing such a nice carriage thought something and did not like to say no and said yes and pointed up to the tree and they told him to come down immediately as there was a young lady in search of him ha 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 jubal did you ever hear such a thing in all your life my brother do you call him your brother well he has been better to me than my brothers well for his kindness he shall accompany you to the palace and see how things turn out after they go to the palace the prince has a good wash and appears before the princess when she asks him had he ever been at the castle of melvales with a smile upon his face he gives a graceful bow and says my lady walk over that handkerchief without stumbling he walks over it many times and dances upon it and nothing happened to him she said with a proud and smiling air that is the young man and out come the objects exchanged by both of them presently she orders a very large box to be brought in and to be opened and out come some of the most costly uniforms that were ever worn on an emperor's back and when he dressed himself up the king could scarcely look upon him from the dazzling of the gold and diamonds on his coat 
he orders his two brothers to be in confinement for a period of time and before the princess asks him to go with her to her own country she pays a visit to the bear's camp and she makes some very handsome presents for their kindness to the young prince and she gives jubal an invitation to go with them which he accepts wishes them a hearty farewell for a while promising to see them all again in some little time they go back to the king and bid farewell and tell him not to be so hasty another time to order people to be beheaded before having a proper cause for it off they go with all their army with them but while the soldiers were striking their tents the prince bethought himself of his welsh harp and had it sent for immediately to take with him in a beautiful wooden case they called to see each of those three brothers whom the prince had to stay with when he was on his way to the castle of melvales and i can assure you when they all got together they had a merry time of it and there we will leave them end of the king of england and his three sons section 29 of more english fairy tales king john and the abbot of canterbury this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs king john and the abbot of canterbury in the reign of king john there lived an abbot of canterbury who kept up grand state in his abbey a hundred of the abbot's men dined each day with him in his refectory and fifty knights in velvet coats and gold chains waited upon him daily well king john as you know was a very bad king so he couldn't brook the idea of any one in his kingdom however holy he might be being honoured more than he so he summoned the abbot of canterbury to his presence the abbot came with a goodly retinue with his fifty knights at arms in velvet cloaks and gold chains the king went to meet him and said to him how now father abbot i hear it of thee thou keepest far greater state than i this becomes not our royal dignity and savours of treason in thee my liege quoth the abbot bending low i beg to say that all i spend has been freely given to the abbey out of the piety of the folk i trust your grace will not take it ill that i spend for the abbey's sake what is the abbey's nay proud prelate answered the king all that is in this fair realm of england is our own and thou hast no right to put me to shame by holding such state however of my clemency i will spare thee thy life and thy property if you can answer me but three questions i will do so my liege said the abbot so far as my poor wit can extend well then said the king tell me where is the centre of all the world round then let me know how soon can i ride the whole world about and lastly tell me what i think your majesty jesteth stammered the abbot thou wilt find it no jest said the king unless thou canst answer me these questions three before a week is out thy head will leave thy body and he turned away well the abbot rode off in fear and trembling and first he went to oxford to see if any learned doctor could tell him the answer to those questions three but none could help him and he took his way to canterbury sad and sorrowful to take leave of his monks but on his way he met his shepherd as he was going to the fold welcome home lord abbot quoth the shepherd what news from good king john sad news sad news my shepherd said the abbot and told him all that had happened now cheer up sir abbot said the shepherd a fool may perhaps answer what a wise man knows not i will go to london in your stead grant me only your apparel and your retinue of knights at the least i can die in your place nay shepherd not so said the abbot i must meet the danger in my own person 
and to that thou canst not pass for me but i can and i will sir abbot in a cowl who will know me for what i am so at last the abbot consented and sent him to london in his most splendid array and he approached king john with all his retinue as before but dressed in his simple monk's dress and his cowl over his face now welcome sir abbot said king john thou art prepared for thy doom i see i am ready to answer your majesty said he well then question first where is the centre of the round earth said the king here said the shepherd abbot planting his crozier in the ground and your majesty believe me not go measure it and see by saint bottle off said the king a merry answer and a shrewd so to question the second how soon may i ride this round world about if your majesty will graciously rise with the sun and ride along with him until the next morning he rise your grace will surely have written it round by saint john laughed king john i did not think it could be done so soon but let that pass and tell me question third and last and that is what do i think that is easy your grace said he your majesty thinks i am my lord the abbot of canterbury but as you may see and here he raised his cowl i am but his poor shepherd and am come to ask your pardon for him and for me ha 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 loud laughed the king well caught thou hast more wit than thy lord and thou shalt be abbot in his place nay that cannot be quoth the shepherd i know not how to write nor to read well then four nobles a week thou shalt have for the ready wit and tell the abbot from me that he has my pardon and with that king john sent away the shepherd with a right royal present besides his pension end of king john and the abbot of canterbury section 30 of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by janet ketch more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs russian coty there was once a king and a queen as many a one has been few have we seen and as few may we see but the queen died leaving only one bonny girl and she told her on her deathbed my dear after i am gone there will come to you a little red calf and whenever you want anything speak to it and it will give it you now after a while the king married again an ill-natured wife with three ugly daughters of her own and they hated the king's daughter because she was so bonny so they took all her fine clothes away from her and gave her only a coat made of rushes so they called her russian coatie and made her sit in the kitchen nook amid the ashes and when dinner-time came the nasty stepmother sent her out a thimbleful of broth a grain of barley a thread of meat and a crumb of bread but when she had eaten all this she was just as hungry as before so she said to herself oh how i wish i had something to eat just then who should come in but a little red calf and said to her put your finger into my left ear she did so and found some nice bread then the calf told her to put her finger into its right ear and she found there some cheese and made a right good meal of the bread and cheese and so it went on from day to day now the king's wife thought rush and cody would soon die from the scanty food she got and she was surprised to see her as lively and healthy as ever 
so she set one of her ugly daughters on the watch at mealtimes to find out how rush and cody got enough to live on the daughter soon found out that the red calf gave food to rush and cody and told her mother so her mother went to the king and told him she was longing to have a sweetbread from a red calf then the king sent for his butcher and had the little red calf killed and when rush and cody heard of it she sat down and wept by its side but the dead calf said take me up bone by bone and put me beneath you gray stone when there is aught you want tell it me and that i'll grant so she did so but could not find the shank bone of the calf now the very next sunday was yuletide and all the folk were going to church in their best clothes so rush and cody said oh i should like to go to church too but the three ugly sisters said what would you do at the church you nasty thing you must bite at home and make the dinner and the king's wife said and this is what you must make the soup of a thimble full of water a grain of barley and a crumb of bread when they all went to church rush and cody sat down and wept but looking up who should she see coming in limping lamping with a shank wanting but the dear red calf and the red calf said to her do not sit there weeping but go put on these clothes and above all put on this pair of glass slippers and go your way to church but what will become of the dinner said rush and cody oh do not fash about that said the red calf all you have to do is to say to the fire every peat make the other burn every spit make the other turn every pot make the other play till i come from church this good yule day and be off to church with you but mind you come home first so rush and cody said this and went off to church and she was the grandest and finest lady there there happened to be a young prince there and he fell at once in love with her but she came away before service was over and was home before the rest and had off her fine clothes and on with her rush and cody and she found the calf had covered the table and the dinner was ready and everything was in good order when the rest came home the three sisters said to rush and cody hey lassie if you had seen the bonny fine lady in church to-day that the young prince fell in love with then she said oh i wish you would let me go with you to church to-morrow for they used to go three days together to church at yuletide but they said what should the like of you do at church nasty thing the kitchen nook is good enough for you so the next day they all went to church and rush and cody was left behind to make dinner out of a thimble full of water a grain of barley a crumb of bread and a thread of meat but the red calf came to her help again gave her finer clothes than before and she went to church where all the world was looking at her and wondering where such a grand lady came from and the prince fell more in love with her than ever and tried to find out where she went to but she was too quick for him and got home long before the rest and the red calf had the dinner all ready the next day the calf dressed her in even grander clothes than before and she went to the church and the young prince was there again and this time he put a guard at the door to keep her but she took a hop and a run and jumped over their heads and as she did so down fell one of her glass slippers she didn't wait to pick it up you may be sure but off she ran home as fast as she could go on with the russian cody and the calf had all things ready then the young prince put out a proclamation that whoever could put on the glass slipper should be his bride all the ladies of his court went and tried to put on the slipper and they tried and tried and tried but it was too small for them all then he ordered one of his ambassadors to mount a fleet horse and ride through the kingdom and find an owner for the glass shoe he rode and he rode to town and castle and made all the ladies try to put on the shoe 
many a one tried to get it on that she might be the prince's bride but no it wouldn't do and many a one wept i warrant because she couldn't get on the bonny glass shoe the ambassador rode on and on till he came at the very last to the house where there were the three ugly sisters the first two tried it and it wouldn't do and the queen mad with spite hacked off the toes and heels of the third sister and she could then put the slipper on and the prince was brought to marry her for he had to keep his promise the ugly sister was dressed all in her best and was put up behind the prince on horseback and off they rode in great gallantry but ye all know pride must have a fall for as they rode along a raven sang out of a bush hacked heels and pinched toes behind the young prince rides but pretty feet and little feet behind the cauldron bides what's that the birdie sings said the young prince nasty lying thing said the stepsister never mind what it says but the prince looked down and saw the slipper dripping with blood so he rode back and put her down then he said there must be some one that the slipper has not been tried on oh no said they there's none but a dirty thing that sits in the kitchen nook and wears a russian coaty but the prince was determined to try it on russian coaty but she ran away to the gray stone where the red calf dressed her in her bravest dress and she went to the prince and the slipper jumped out of his pocket on to her foot fitting her without any chipping or paring so the prince married her that very day and they lived happy ever after end of russian cody recording by janet ketch section thirty one of more english fairy tales the king of the cats this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruhi ha more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs the king of the cats one winter's evening the sexton's wife was sitting by the fireside with her big black cat old tom on the other side both half asleep and waiting for the master to come home they waited and they waited but still he didn't come till at last he came rushing in calling out who's tommy tildrum in such a wild way that both his wife and his cat stared at him to know what was the matter why what's the matter said his wife and why do you want to know who tommy tildrum is oh i've had such an adventure i was digging away at old mr fordyce's grave when i suppose i must have dropped asleep and only woke up by hearing a cat's meow meow said old tom in answer yes just like that so i looked over the edge of the grave and what do you think i saw now how can i tell said the sexton's wife why nine black cats all like our friend tom here all with a white spot on their chestesses and what do you think they were carrying why a small coffin covered with a black velvet pall and on the pall was a small coronet all of gold and at every third step they took they all cried together meow meow said old tom again yes just like that said the sexton and as they came nearer and nearer to me i could see them more distinctly because their eyes shone out with a sort of green light well they all came towards me eight of them carrying the coffin and the biggest cat of all walking in front for all the world like but look at our tom how he's looking at me you'd think he knew all i was saying go on go on said his wife never mind old tom well as i was a saying they came towards me slowly and solemnly and at every third step crying all together meow meow said old tom again yes 
just like that till they came and stood right opposite mr fordyce's grave where i was when they all stood still and looked straight at me i did feel queer that i did but look at old tom he's looking at me just like they did go on go on said his wife never mind old tom where was i oh they all stood still looking at me when the one that wasn't carrying the coffin came forward and staring straight at me said to me yes i tell ye said to me with a squeaky voice tell tom tildrum that tom tildrum's dead and that's why i asked you if you knew who tom tildrum was for how can i tell tom tildrum tim tildrum's dead if i don't know who tom tildrum is look at old tom look at old tom look at old tom screamed his wife and well he might look for tom was swelling and tom was staring and at last tom shrieked out what old tim dead then i am the king of the cats and rushed up the chimney and was never more seen end of the king of the cats Section thirty two of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shakira. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. Tamlane. Young Tamlane was the son of Earl Murray, and Bird Janet was the daughter of Dunbar, Earl of March, and when they were young they loved one another, and plighted their troth. But when the time came near for their marrying, Tamlane disappeared, and none knew what had become of him. Many, many days after he had disappeared, Bird Janet was wandering in the Carterhaw woods though she had been warned not to go there. And as she wandered, she plucked the flowers from the bushes. She came at last to a bush of broom, and began plucking it. She had not taken more than three flowerets, when by her side up started young Tamlane. "'Where come ye from, Tamlane, Tamlane?' Bird Janet said. "'And why have you been away so long?' from elfland i come said young tamlane the queen of elfland has made me her knight but how did you get there tamlane said bird janet i was hunting one day and as i rode widdershins round yon hill a deep drowsiness fell upon me and when i awoke behold i was in elfland fair is that land and gay and fain would i stop but for thee and one other thing every seven years the elves pay their tithe to the netherworld and for all the queen makes much of me i fear it is myself that will be the tithe oh can you not be saved tell me if aught i can do will save you tamlane only one thing is there for my safety Tomorrow night is Halloween, and the fairy court will then ride through England and Scotland, and if you would borrow me from Elfland, you must take your stand by Miles Cross between twelve and one of the night, and with holy water in your hand you must cast a compass all around you. But how shall I know you, Tamlane? quoth Bird Janet, amid so many nights I've ne'er seen before. The first court of elves that come by let pass. The next court you shall pay reverence to, but do naught nor say aught. But the third court that comes by is the chief court of them, and at the head rides the queen of all elfland, and I shall ride by her side upon a milk-white steed with a star in my crown. They give me this honour as being a christened knight. Watch my hands, Janet. The right one will be gloved, but the left one will be bare, and by that token you will know me. 
but how to save you tamlaine quoth bird janet you must spring upon me suddenly and i will fall to the ground then seize me quick and whatever change befall me for they will exercise all their magic on me cling hold to me till they turn me into red-hot iron then cast me into this pool and i will be turned back into a mother naked man cast then your green mantle over me and i shall be yours and be of the world again so bird janet promised to do all for tamlaine and at the next night at midnight she took her stand by miles cross and cast a compass about her with holy water soon there came riding by the elfin court first over the mound went a troop on black steeds and then another troop on brown but in the third court all on milk-white steeds she saw the queen of elfland and by her side a knight with a star in his crown with right hand gloved and the left bare then she knew this was her own tamlaine and springing forward she seized the bridle of the milk-white steed and pulled its rider down and as soon as he had touched the ground she let go the bridle and seized him in her arms he's won he's won amongst us all shrieked out the eldritch crew and all came around her and tried their spells on young tamlaine first they turned him in janet's arms like frozen ice then into a huge flame of roaring fire then again the fire vanished and an adder was skipping through her arms but still she held on and then they turned him into a snake that reared up as if to bite her and yet she held on then suddenly a dove was struggling in her arms and almost flew away then they turned him into a swan but all was in vain till at last he was turned into a red-hot glaive and this she cast into a well of water and then he turned back into a mother naked man she quickly cast her green mantle over him and young tamlaine was bird janet's forever then sang the queen of elfland as the court turned away and began to resume its march she that has borrowed young tamlaine has gotten a stately groom she's taken away my bonniest knight left nothing in his room but had I known, Tamlane, Tamlane, a lady would borrow thee, I'd ha' taen out thy two grey eyen, put in to iron of three. Had I but known, Tamlane, Tamlane, before we came from home, I'd ha' taen out thy heart of flesh, put in a heart of stone. Had I but had the wit yestreen, that I have got to-day, I'd paid the fiend seven times his tind, ere you'd be won away. And then the elfin court rode away, and Bird Janet and young Tamlane went their way homewards, and were soon after married, after young Tamlane had again been saned by the holy water, and made Christian once more. End of Tamlane Recording by Shakira Section 33 of More English Fairy Tales The Stars in the Sky. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Stars in the Sky once on a time and twice on a time and all times together as ever i heard tell of there was a tiny lassie who would weep all day to have the stars in the sky to play with she wouldn't have this and she wouldn't have that but it was always the stars she would have so one fine day off she went to find them and she walked and she walked and she walked 
till by and by she came to a mill dam good e'en to ye says she i am seeking the stars in the sky to play with have you seen any oh yes my bonny lassie said the mill dam they shine in my face o nights till i can't sleep for them jump in and perhaps you'll find one so she jumped in and swam about and swam about and swam about but ne'er a one could she see so she went on till she came to a brooklet good e'en to ye brooklet brooklet says she i am seeking the stars in the sky to play with have you seen any yes indeed my bonny lassie said the brooklet they glint on my banks at night paddle about and maybe you'll find one so she paddled and she paddled and she paddled but ne'er a one did she find so on she went till she came to the good folk good e'en to ye good folk says she i'm looking for the stars in the sky to play with have ye seen e'er a one why yes my bonny lassie said the good folk they shine on the grass here o night dance with us and maybe you'll find one and she danced and she danced and she danced but ne'er a one did she see so down she sat i suppose she wept oh dearie me oh dearie me says she i've swam and i've paddled and i've danced and if ye'll not help me i shall never find the stars in the sky to play with but the good folk whispered together and one of them came up to her and took her by the hand and said if you won't go home to your mother go forward go forward mind you take the right road ask four feet to carry you to no feet at all and tell no feet at all to carry you to the stairs without steps and if you climb that oh shall i be among the stars in the sky then cried the lassie if you'll not be then you'll be elsewhere said the good folk and set to dancing again so on she went again with a light heart and by and by she came to a saddled horse tied to a tree good e'en to ye beast said she i'm seeking the stars in the sky to play with will you give me a lift for all my bones are an aching nay said the horse i know not of the stars in the sky and i'm here to do the bidding of the good folk and not my own will well said she it's from the good folk i come and they bade me tell four feet to carry me to no feet at all that's another story said he jump up and ride with me so they rode and they rode and they rode till they got out of the forest and found themselves at the edge of the sea and on the water in front of them was a wide glistening path running straight out towards a beautiful thing that rose out of the water and went up into the sky and was all the colours in the world blue and red and green and wonderful to look at now get you down said the horse and i've brought ye to the end of the land and that's as much as four feet can do i must be away home to my own folk but said the lassie where's no feet at all and where's the stair without steps i know not said the horse it's none of my business neither so good e'en to ye my bonny lassie and off he went so the lassie stood still and looked at the water till a strange kind of fish came swimming up to her feet good e'en to ye big fish says she i'm looking for the stars in the sky and for the stairs that climb up to them will ye show me the way nay said the fish i can't unless you bring me word from the good folk yes indeed said she they said four feet would bring me to no feet at all and no feet at all would carry me to the stairs without steps ah well said the fish that's all right then get on my back and hold fast and off he went spur splash into the water along the silver path towards the bright arch and the nearer they came the brighter the sheen of it till she had to shade her eyes from the light of it and as they came to the foot of it she saw it was a broad bright road sloping up and away into the sky and at the far far end of it she could see wee shining things dancing about now said the fish 
here you are and yawns the stair climb up if you can but hold on fast i'll warrant you'll find the stair easier at home than by such a way twas ne'er meant for lassie's feet to travel and off he splashed through the water so she clomb and she clomb and she clomb and ne'er a step higher did she get the light was before her and around her and the water behind her and the more she struggled the more she was forced down into the dark and the cold and the more she clomb the deeper she fell but she clomb and she clomb till she got dizzy in the light and shivered with the cold and dazed with the fear but still she clomb till at last quite dazed and silly like she let clean go and sank down 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 and bang she came on to the hard boards and found herself sitting weeping and wailing by the bedside at home all alone end of the stars in the sky section thirty four of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs news mr g read by ray casper the steward read by maria casper Huh, Stuart, how are you, my old boy? How do things go on at home? Bad enough, your honor. The magpie's dead. Poor mag. So he's gone. How came he to die? Over ate himself, sir. Did he indeed? A greedy dog. Why, what did he get that he liked so well? A horse flesh. He died of eating horse flesh. How came he to get so much horse flesh? All your father's horses, sir. What, are they dead too? Aye, sir. They died of overwork. And why were they overworked? To carry water, sir. To carry water? And what were they carrying water for? Sure, sir, to put out the fire. Fire? What fire? Your father's house is burned down to the ground. My father's house burnt down? And how came it to be on fire? I think, sir, it must have been the torches. Torches? What torches? At your mother's funeral. My mother dead? Ay, poor lady. She never looked up after it. After what? The loss of your father my father gone too yes poor gentleman he took to his bed as soon as he heard of it heard of what the bad news and please your honour what more miseries more bad news yes sir your bank is failed your credit is lost and you're not worth a shilling in the world i make so bold sir as to come and wait on you about it for I thought you would like to hear the news. End of section 34 Section 35 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs paddock mousie and ratten there lived a paddock in a well and a merry mousie in a mill paddock he would a wooing red sword and pistol by his side paddock came to the mousie's inn mistress mousie are you within yes kind sir i am within softly do i sit and spin madam i am come to woo marriage i must have of you marriage i will grant you none 
till uncle ratton he comes home see uncle ratton's now come in then go and bask the bride within who is it that sits next the wall but lady mousie both slim and small who is it that sits next the bride but lord puddock with yellow side but soon came ducky and with her sir drake ducky takes puddock and makes him squeak then came in the old carl cat with a fiddle on his back do ye any music lack puddock he swam down the brook sir drake he catched him in his fluke the cat he pulled lord ratton down the kittens they did claw his crown but lady mousie so slim and small crept into a hole beneath the wall squeak quoth she i'm out of it all end of paddock mousie and ratton Section thirty six of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Little Bull Calf centuries of years ago when almost all this part of the country was wilderness there was a little boy who lived in a poor bit of property and his father gave him a little bull calf and with it he gave him everything he wanted for it but soon after his father died and his mother got married again to a man that turned out to be a very vicious stepfather who couldn't abide the little boy so at last the stepfather said if you bring that bull calf into this house i'll kill it what a villain he was wasn't he now this little boy used to go out and feed his bull calf every day with barley bread and when he did so this time an old man came up to him we can guess who that was eh and said to him you and your bull calf had better go away and seek your fortune so he went on and he went on and on and on as far as i could tell you till to-morrow night and he went up to a farmhouse and begged a crust of bread and when he got back he broke it in two and gave half of it to the bull calf and then he went to another house and begged a bit of cheese crude and when he went back he wanted to give half of it to the bull calf no says the bull calf i'm going across the field into the wild wood wilderness country where there'll be tigers leopards wolves monkeys and a fiery dragon and i'll kill them all except the fiery dragon and he'll kill me the little boy did cry and said oh no my little bull calf i hope he won't kill you yes he will said the little bull calf so you climb up that tree so that no one can come nigh you but the monkeys and if they come the cheese crude will save you and when i'm killed the dragon will go away for a bit then you must come down the tree and skin me and take out my bladder and blow it out and it will kill everything you hit with it so when the fiery dragon comes back you hit it with my bladder and cut its tongue out we know there were fiery dragons in those days like george and his dragon in the legend but there it's not the same world nowadays the world is turned topsy-turvy since then like as if you'd turn it over with a spade of course he did all the little bull calf told him he climbed up the tree and the monkeys climbed up the tree after him but he held the cheese crude in his hand and said i'll squeeze your heart like the flintstone so the monkey cocked his eye as much as to say if you can squeeze a flint stone to make the juice come out of it you can squeeze me but he didn't say anything for a monkey's cunning but down he went and all the while the little bull calf was fighting all the wild beasts on the ground and the little lad was clapping his hands up the tree and calling out 
go in my little bull calf well fought little bull calf and he mastered everything except the fiery dragon but the fiery dragon killed the little bull calf but the lad waited and waited till he saw the dragon go away then he came down and skinned the little bull calf and took out its bladder and went after the dragon and as he went on what should he see but a king's daughter staked down by the hair of her head for she had been put there for the dragon to destroy her so he went up and untied her hair but she said my time has come for the dragon to destroy me go away you can do no good but he said no i can master it and i won't go and for all her begging and praying he would stop and soon he heard it coming roaring and raging from afar off and at last it came near spitting fire and with a tongue like a great spear so you could hear it roaring for miles and it was making for the place where the king's daughter was staked down and when it came up to them the lad had just hit it on the head with the bladder and the dragon fell down dead but before it died it bit off the little boy's forefinger then the lad cut out the dragon's tongue and said to the king's daughter i've done all i can i must leave you and sorry she was he had to go and before he went she tied a diamond ring in his hair and said good-bye to him by and by who should come along but the old king lamenting and weeping expecting to see nothing of his daughter but the prince of the place where she had been but he was surprised to find her there alive and safe and he said how came you to be saved so she told him how she had been saved and he took her home to his castle again well he put it into all the papers to find out who saved his daughter and who had the dragon's tongue and the princess's diamond ring and was without his forefinger whoever could show these signs could marry his daughter and have his kingdom after his death well any number of gentlemen came from all parts of england with forefingers cut off and with diamond rings and all kinds of tongues wild beasts tongues and foreign tongues but they couldn't show any dragon's tongues so they were turned away at last the little boy turned up looking very ragged and desolated like and the king's daughter cast her eye on him till her father grew very angry and ordered them to turn the little beggar boy away father says she i know something of that boy well still the fine gentlemen came bringing up their dragon's tongues that weren't dragon's tongues and at last the little boy came up dressed a little better so the old king says i see you've got an eye on that boy if it has to be him it must be him but all the others were fit to kill him and cried out pooh pooh turn that boy out it can't be him but the king said now now my boy let's see what you have to show well he showed the diamond ring with her name on it and the fiery dragon's tongue how the others were thunderstruck when he showed his proofs but the king told him you shall have my daughter and my estate so he married the princess and afterward got the king's estate then his stepfather came and wanted to own him but the young king didn't know such a man end of the little bull calf Section 37 of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. The Wee Wee Manny. Once upon a time, when all big folks were wee ones, and all lies were true, there was a wee wee manny that had a big, big coo and out he went to milk her of a morning, and said, Hold still, my coo, my hinny, Hold still, my hinny, my coo, And you shall have for your dinner What but a milk-white do. But the big, big coo wouldn't hold still. Hoot! said the wee, wee manny. 
Hold still, my coo, my dearie, and fill my bucket with milk. And if you'll be no contrary, I'll gie a gown of silk. But the big, big coo wouldn't hold still. Look at that now," said the wee, wee manny. "What's a wee, wee manny to do with such a big contrary coo?" So off he went to his mother at the house. "Mother," said he. Coo won't stand still, and wee wee manny can't milk big big coo. Hoot, says his mother. Take stick and beat coo. So off he went to get a stick from the tree, and said, "Break stick, break, and I'll gie ye a cake." But the stick wouldn't break, so back he went to the house. Mother, says he. Coo won't hold still. Stick won't break. Wee wee manny can't beat big big coo. Hoot, says his mother. Go to the butcher and bid him kill coo. So off he went to the butcher, and said, "Butcher, kill the big big coo. She'll gie us no more milk now." But the butcher wouldn't kill the coo without a silver penny. So back the manny went to the house. Mother, says he, Coo won't hold still, stick won't break, butcher won't kill without a silver penny, and wee wee manny can't milk big big coo. Well, said his mother, go to the coo and tell her there's a weary weary lady with long yellow hair weeping for a cup of milk. So off he went and told the coo, but she wouldn't hold still. So back he went and told his mother. Well, said she, tell the coo, there's a fine, fine laddie from the wars sitting by the weary, weary lady with golden hair, and she weeping for a sup of milk. So off he went and told the coo, but she wouldn't hold still. So back he went and told his mother. Well, said his mother, tell the big, big coo. There's a sharp, sharp sword at the belt of the fine, fine laddie from the wars, who sits beside the weary, weary lady with the golden hair, and she weeping for a sup of milk. And he told the big, big coo, but she wouldn't hold still. Then said his mother, "Run quick, and tell her." That her head going to be cut off by the sharp, sharp sword in the hands of the fine, fine laddie, if she doesn't give the sup of milk the weary, weary lady weeps for. And wee, wee manny went off and told the big, big coo. And when coo saw the glint of the sharp, sharp sword in the hand of the fine, fine laddie come from the wars, and the weary, weary lady weeping for a sup of milk, she reckoned she'd better hold still. So wee wee manny milked big big coo, and the weary weary lady with the golden hair hushed her weeping, and got her supper milk, and the fine fine laddie new come from the wars put by his sharp sharp sword, and all went well that didn't go ill. End of the wee wee manny, recording by Daniel Noonan. Section thirty eight of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Douglas Taylor, Fort Townsend, Washington. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. Habe Trot and Scantly Mab. A woman had one fair daughter who loved play better than work, wandering in the meadows and lanes better than the spinning wheel and distaff. The mother was heartily vexed at this, for in those days no lassie had any chance of a good husband unless she was an industrious spinster. So she coaxed, threatened, even beat her daughter, but all to no purpose. The girl remained what her mother called her, an idle cutty. At last, one spring morning, the good wife gave her seven heads of lint, saying she would take no excuse, they must be returned in three days spun into yarn. 
The girl saw her mother was in earnest, so she plied her distaff as well as she could, but her hands were all untaught, and by the evening of the second day only a very small part of her task was done. She cried herself to sleep that night, and in the morning, throwing aside her work in despair, she strolled out into the fields all sparkling with dew. At last she reached a knoll, at whose feet ran a little burn, shaded with woodbine and wild roses, and there she sat down, burying her face in her hands. When she looked up she was surprised to see, by the margin of the stream, an old woman, quite unknown to her, drawing out the thread as she basked in the sun. There was nothing very remarkable in her appearance except the length and thickness of her lisp. Only she was seated on a self-bored stone. The girl rose, went to the good dame, and gave her a friendly greeting, but could not help inquiring, "'What makes you so long-lipped?' "'Spinning thread, my hinny,' said the old woman, pleased with her. "'I wet my fingers with my lips as I draw the thread from the distaff.' "'Ah,' said the girl, "'I should be spinning too, but it's all to no purpose. I shall ne'er do my task.' On which the old woman proposed to do it for her. Overjoyed, the maiden ran to fetch her lint and placed it in her new friend's hand, asking where she should call for the yarn in the evening but she received no reply. The old woman passed away from her among the trees and bushes. The girl, much bewildered, wandered about a little, sat down to rest, and finally fell asleep by the little knoll. When she awoke she was surprised to find that it was evening. Cosleen, the evening star, was beaming with silvery light, soon to be lost in the moon's splendor. While watching these changes, the maiden was startled by the sound of an uncouth voice which seemed to issue from below the self-bored stone close beside her. She laid her ear to the stone and heard the words, "'Hurry up, scantly Mab, for I've promised a yarn, and Habe Trot always keeps her promise.' Then, looking down the hole, saw her friend, the old dame, walking backwards and forwards in a deep cavern among a group of spinsters all seated on colludy stones and busy with distaff and spindle. An ugly company they were, with lips more or less disfigured like old Habetross. Another of the sisterhood, who sat in a distant corner reeling the yarn, was marked in addition by grey eyes which seemed starting from her head and a long hooked nose. While the girl was still watching she heard Habetrot address this dame by the name of Scantly Mab and say, "'Bundle up the yarn. It is time the young lassie should give it to her mother.' Delighted to hear this, the girl got up and returned homewards. Habetrot soon overtook her and placed the yarn in her hands. "'Oh, what can I do for ye in return?' exclaimed she in delight. "'Nothing, nothing,' replied the dame. "'But dinna tell your mother who spun the yarn.' Scarcely believing her eyes, the girl went home, where she found her mother had been busy making saucers, and hanging them up in the chimney to dry, and then, tired out, had retired to rest. Finding herself very hungry after her long day on the knoll, the girl took down pudding after pudding, fried and ate them, and at last went to bed, too. The mother was up first the next morning, and when she came into the kitchen and found her saucers all gone, and the seven hanks of yarn lying beautifully smooth and bright upon the table, she ran out of the house wildly crying out, My daughter's spun seven, 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 my daughter's eaten seven, 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 and all before daylight. A laird, who chanced to be riding by, heard the exclamation, but could not understand it, so he rode up and asked the good wife what was the matter, on which she broke out again. My daughter's spun seven, 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 my daughter's eaten seven, 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 before daylight, and if ye dinna believe me, why come in and see it. The laird he alighted and went into the cottage, where he saw the yarn and admired it so much he begged to see the spinner. The mother dragged in her girl. He vowed he was lonely without a wife, and had long been in search of one who was a good spinner. So their troth was plighted and the wedding took place soon afterwards, though the bride was in great fear that she should not prove so clever at her spinning wheel as he expected. But old Dame Habetrot came to her aid. 
"'Bring your bonny bridegroom to my cell,' said she to the young bride soon after her marriage. "'He shall see what comes of spinning, and never will he tie you to the spinning-wheel.' Accordingly, the bride led her husband the next day to the flowery knoll, and bade him look through the self-bored stone. Great was his surprise to behold Habetrot dancing and jumping over her rock, singing all the time this ditty to her sisterhood, while they kept time with their spindles. We who live in dreary den are both rank and foul to see, hidden from the glorious sun that teems the fair earth's canopy. Ever must our evenings lone be spent on the Kuludi stone. Cheerless is the evening gray, when Kosleen hath died away, but ever bright and ever fair are they who breathe this evening air, and lean upon the self-bored stone, unseen by all but me alone. The song ended. Scantly Mab asked Habetrot what she meant by the last line, unseen by all but we alone. There is one, replied Habetrot, whom I bid to come here at this hour, and he has heard my song through the self-bored stone. So saying, she rose, opened another door, which was concealed by the roots of an old tree, and invited the pair to come in and see her family. The laird was astonished at the weird-looking company, as he well might be, and inquired of one after another the cause of their strange lips. In a different tone of voice, and with a different twist of the mouth, each answered that it was occasioned by spinning. At least they tried to say so, but one grunted out, Nakosin, and another, Akosan, while a third murmured, Orsin. All, however, made the bridegroom understand what was the cause of their ugliness, while Habetrot slyly hinted that if his wife were allowed to spin, her pretty lips would grow out of shape too, and her pretty face get an ugsome look. So, before he left the cave, he vowed that his little wife should never touch a spinning wheel, and he kept his word. She used to wander in the meadows by his side or ride behind him over the hills but all the flax grown on his land was sent to old Habetrot to be converted into yarn. End of Habetrot and Scantly Mab Recording by Douglas Taylor, Port Townsend, Washington Old Mother Wiggle Waggle Read by Ruhi Hutt the fox and his wife they had a great strife they never ate mustard in all their whole life they ate their meat without fork or knife and loved to be picking a bone a o the fox went out one still clear night and he prayed the moon to give him light for he'd a long way to travel that night before he got back to his den o the fox, when he came to yonder stile, he lifted his lugs and listened a while. Oh, ho, oh, said the fox, it's but a short mile from this unto yonder wee town, eh, ho. Oh. And first he arrived at a farmer's yard, where the ducks and the geese declared it was hard, that their nerves should be shaken and their rest should be marred by the visits of Mr. Fox, oh. The fox, when he came to the farmer's gate, who should he see but the farmer's drake? I love you well for your master's sake, and long to be picking your bones, hey ho! The grey goose she ran round the haystack. Oh ho! said the fox, you are very fat. You'll grease my beard and ride on my back from this into yonder wee town, hey ho! Then he took the grey goose by her sleeve and said, Madam grey goose, by your leave, I'll take you away without reprieve and carry you back to my den. Oh, and he seized the black duck by the neck and slung him all across his back. The black duck cried out, quack, 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 with his legs all dangling down. Oh, old mother wiggle woggle hopped out of bed. Out of the window she popped her old head. Oh, husband, oh, husband, the grey goose is gone, and the fox is off to his den, oh. Then the old man got up in his red cap, and swore he would catch the fox in a trap, 
but the fox was too cunning and gave him the slip and ran through the town the town oh when he got to the top of the hill he blew his trumpet both loud and shrill for joy that he was safe and sound through the town oh but at last he arrived at his home again to his dear little foxes eight nine ten says he you're in luck here's a fine fat duck with his legs all dangling down oh so he sat down together with his hungry wife and they did very well without fork or knife they never ate a better duck in all their life and the little ones picked the bones oh end of old mother wiggle woggle section forty of more english fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording is by matt butcher peoria illinois you can go to my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com. You can also find my books on Audible by searching matt.butcher. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs Stupid's Cries There once was a little boy, and his mother sent him to buy a sheep's head and pluck. Afraid he should forget it, the lad kept saying all the way along, Sheep's head and pluck, sheep's head and pluck. Trudging along, he came to a stile, but in getting over he fell and hurt himself and beginning to blubber, forgot what he was sent for. So he stood a little while to consider. At last he thought he recollected it, and began to repeat, Liver and lights and gall and all, liver and lights and gall and all. Away he went again, and came to where a man had a pain in his liver, bawling out, Liver and lights and gall and all, liver and lights and gall and all. Whereon the man laid hold of him and beat him, bidding him say, Pray God, send no more, pray God, send no more. The youngster strode along, uttering these words, till he reached a field where a hind was sowing wheat. Pray God, send no more. Pray God, send no more. This was all his cry. So the sower began to thrash him, and charged him to repeat, Pray God, send plenty more. Pray God, send plenty more. Off the child scampered with these words in his mouth till he reached a churchyard and met a funeral. But he went on with his, Pray God, send plenty more. Pray God, send plenty more. The chief mourner seized and punished him, and bade him repeat, Pray God send the soul to heaven, pray God send the soul to heaven. Away went the boy, and met a dog and a cat going to be hung, but his cry rang out, Pray God send the soul to heaven, pray God send the soul to heaven. The good folk nearly were furious, seized and struck him, charging him to say, A dog and a cat are going to be hung, a dog and a cat are going to be hung. This the poor fellow did, till he overtook a man and a woman going to be married. Uh-oh, he shouted, a dog and a cat are going to be hung, a dog and a cat are going to be hung. The man was enraged, as we may well think, gave him many a thump, and ordered him to repeat, I wish you much joy, I wish you much joy. This he did, jogging along, till he came to two laborers, who had fallen into a ditch. The lad kept bawling out, I wish you much joy, I wish you much joy. This vexed one of the folk so sorely that he used all his strength, scrambled out, beat the crier, and told him to say, The one is out, I wish the other was. The one is out, I wish the other was. On went youngin till he found a fellow with only one eye, but he kept up his song. The one is out, I wish the other was. The one is out, I wish the other was. This was too much for Master One-Eye, who grabbed him and chastised him, bidding him call. The one side gives good light, I wish the other did. The one side gives good light, I wish the other did. So he did, to be sure, till he came to a house, one side of which was on fire. The people here thought it was he who had set the place ablazing, and straightway put him into prison. The end was, the judge put on his black cap and condemned him to die. End of Stupid's Cries This recording was by Matt Butcher, out of Peoria, Illinois. You can visit my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com or you can find my narrated books on Audible by searching Matt.Butcher. Section 41 of More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs catskin well there was once a gentleman who had fine lands and houses and he very much wanted to have a son to be heir to them so when his wife brought him a daughter bonny as bonny could be he cared not for her and said let me never see her face so she grew up a bonny girl though her father never set eyes on her till she was fifteen years old and was ready to be married but her father said let her marry the first that comes for her and when this was known who should be the first but a nasty rough old man so she didn't know what to do and went to the henwife and asked her advice the henwife said say you will not take him unless they give you a coat of silver cloth well they gave her a coat of silver cloth but she wouldn't take him for all that but went again to the henwife who said say you will not take him unless they give you a coat of beaten gold well they gave her a coat of beaten gold but still she would not take him but went to the henwife who said say you will not take him unless they give you a coat made of the feathers of all the birds in the air so they sent a man with a great heap of peace and the man cried to all the birds of the air each bird take a pea and put down a feather so each bird took a pea and put down one of its feathers so they took all the feathers and made a coat of them and gave it to her but still she would not but asked the henwife once again who said say they must first make you a coat of catskin so they made her a coat of catskin and she put it on and tied up her other coats and ran away into the woods so she went along and went along and went along till she came to the end of the wood and saw a fine castle so there she hid her fine dresses and went up to the castle gates and asked for work the lady of the castle saw her and told her i am sorry i have no better place but if you like you may be a scullion so down she went into the kitchen and they called her catskin because of her dress but the cook was very cruel to her and led her a sad life well it happened soon after that the young lord of the castle was coming home and there was to be a grand ball in honour of the occasion and when they were speaking about it among the servants dear me mrs cook said catskin how much i should like to go what you dirty impudent slut said the cook you go among all the fine lords and ladies with your filthy catskin a fine figure you'd cut and with that she took a basin of water and dashed it into catskin's face but she only briskly shook her ears and said nothing when the day of the ball arrived catskin slipped out of the house and went to the edge of the forest where she had hidden her dresses so she bathed herself in a crystal waterfall and then put on her coat of silver cloth and hastened away to the ball as soon as she entered all were overcome by her beauty and grace while the young lord at once lost his heart to her he asked her to be his partner for the first dance and he would dance with none other the livelong night when it came to parting time the young lord said pray tell me fair maid where you live but catskin curtsied and said kind sir if the truth i must tell at the sign of the basin of water i dwell then she flew from the castle and donned her catskin robe again and slipped into the scullery again unbeknown to the cook the young lad went the very next day to his mother the lady of the castle and declared he would wed none other but the lady of the silver dress and would never rest till he had found her so another ball was soon arranged for in hope that the beautiful maid would appear again so catskin said to the cook oh how i should like to go 
whereupon the cook screamed out in a rage what you you dirty impudent slut you would cut a fine figure among all the fine lords and ladies and with that she up with a ladle and broke it across catskin's back but she only shook her ears and ran off to the forest where she first of all bathed then put on her coat of beaten gold and off she went to the ballroom as soon as she entered all eyes were upon her and the young lord soon recognized her as the lady of the basin of water and claimed her hand for the first dance and did not leave her till the last when that came he again asked her where she lived but all that she would say was kind sir if the truth i must tell at the sign of the broken ladle i dwell and with that she curtsied and flew from the ball off with her golden robe on with her catskin and into the scullery without the cook's knowing next day when the young lord could not find where was the sign of the basin of water or of the broken ladle he begged his mother to have another grand ball so that he might meet the beautiful maid once more all happened as before catskin told the cook how much she would like to go to the ball the cook called her a dirty slut and broke the skimmer across her head but she only shook her ears and went off to the forest where she bathed in the crystal spring and then donned her coat of feathers and so off to the ballroom when she entered every one was surprised at so beautiful a face and form dressed in so rich and rare a dress but the young lord soon recognized his beautiful sweetheart and would dance with none but her the whole evening when the ball came to an end he pressed her to tell him where she lived but all she would answer was kind sir if the truth i must tell at the sign of the broken skimmer i dwell and with that she curtsied and was off to the forest but this time the young lord followed her and watched her change her fine dress of feathers for her catskin dress and then he knew her for his own scullery maid next day he went to his mother the lady of the castle and told her that he wished to marry the scullery maid catskin never said the lady and rushed from the room well the young lord was so grieved at that that he took to his bed and was very ill the doctor tried to cure him but he would not take any medicine unless from the hands of catskin so the doctor went to the lady of the castle and told her her son would die if she did not consent to his marriage with catskin so she had to give way and summoned catskin to her but she put on her coat of beaten gold and went to the lady who soon was glad to wed her son to so beautiful a maid well so they were married and after a time a dear little son came to them and grew up a bonny lad and one day when he was four years old a beggar woman came to the door so lady catskin gave some money to the little lord and told him to go and give it to the beggar woman so he went and gave it but put it into the hand of the woman's child who leant forward and kissed the little lord now the wicked old cook why hadn't she been sent away was looking on so she said only see how beggars brats take to one another this insult went to catskin's heart so she went to her husband the young lord and told him all about her father and begged he would go and find out what had become of her parents so they set out in the lord's grand coach and travelled through the forest till they came to catskin's father's house and put up at an inn near where catskin stopped while her husband went to see if her father would own her now her father had never had any other child and his wife had died so he was all alone in the world and sate moping and miserable when the young lord came in he hardly looked up till he saw a chair close up to him and asked him pray sir had you not once a young daughter whom you would never see your own the old gentleman said it is true i am a hardened sinner but i would give all my worldly goods if i could but see her once before i die 
Then the young lord told him what had happened to Catskin, and took him to the inn, and brought his father-in-law to his own castle, where they lived happy ever afterwards. End of Catskin Section 42 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Matt Butcher from Peoria, Illinois. You can go to my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com and you can find my book narrations on Audible by searching matt.butcher. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs The Lambton Worm a wild young fellow was the heir of Lambton, the fine estate and hall by the side of the swift flowing ware. Not a mass would he hear in Brugeford Chapel of a Sunday, but a fishing he would go. And if he did not haul in anything, his curses could be heard by the folk as they went by to Brugeford. Well, one Sunday morning he was fishing as usual, and not a salmon had risen to him. His basket was bare of roach or dace, and the worse his luck, the worse grew his language, till the passers-by were horrified at his words as they went to listen to the mass priest. At last young Lambton felt a mighty tug at his line. At last, quoth he, a bite worth having! And he pulled and he pulled, till what should appear above the water but a head, like an elf's, with nine holes on each side of its mouth. But still he pulled till he had got the thing to land, when it turned out to be a worm of hideous shape, if he had cursed before, his curses were enough to raise the hair on your head. "'What ails thee, my son?' said a voice by his side. "'And what hast thou caught, that thou shouldst stain the Lord's day with such foul language?' Looking round, young Lambton saw a strange old man standing by him. "'Why, truly,' he said, "'I think I have caught the devil himself. Look you and see if you know him.' But the stranger shook his head and said, it bodes no good to thee or thine to bring such a monster to shore, yet cast him not back into the ware. Thou hast caught him, and thou must keep him. And with that away he turned, and was seen no more. The young heir of Lambton took up the gruesome thing, and taking it off his hook, cast it into a well close by, and ever since that day that well has gone by the name of the Worm Well. For some time nothing more was seen or heard of the worm, till one day it had outgrown the size of the well, and came forth full grown. So it came forth from the well and betook itself to the ware, and all day long it would lie coiled round a rock in the middle of the stream, while at night it came forth from the river and harried the countryside. It sucked the cow's milk, devoured the lambs, worried the cattle, and frightened all the women and girls of the district, and then it would retire for the rest of the night to the hill, still called the Worm Hill, on the north side of the ware, about a mile and a half, from Lambton Hall. This terrible visitation brought young Lambton, of Lambton Hall, to his senses. He took upon himself the vows of the cross, and departed for the Holy Land, in the hope that the scourge he had brought upon his district would disappear. But the grisly worm took no heed, except that it crossed the river, and came right up to Lambton Hall itself, where the old lord lived on, all alone, his only son having gone to the Holy Land. What to do? The worm was coming closer and closer to the hall. Women were shrieking, men were gathering weapons, dogs were barking, and horses neighing with terror. At last the steward called out to the dairy maids, Bring all your milk hither, and when they did so, and had brought all the milk that the nine kai of the buyer had yielded, he poured it all into the long stone trough in front of the hall. The worm drew nearer and nearer, till at last it came up to the trough. But when it sniffed the milk, it turned aside to the trough and swallowed all the milk up, and then slowly turned round and crossed the river ware, and coiled its bulk three times round the worm hill for the night. Henceforth the worm would cross the river every day, and woe betide the hall if the trough contained the milk of less than nine kai. The worm would hiss and would rave and lash its tail round the trees of the park, and in its fury it would uproot the stoutest oaks and the loftiest firs. So it went on for seven years. Many tried to destroy the worm, but all had failed, and many a knight had lost his life in fighting with the monster, which slowly crushed the life out of all that came near it. At last the child of Lambton came home to his father's hall, after seven long years spent in meditation and repentance on holy soil, 
sad and desolate he found his folk the lands untilled the farms deserted half the trees of the park uprooted for none would stay to tend the nine kai that the monster needed for his food each day the child sought his father and begged his forgiveness for the curse he had brought on the hall thy sin is pardoned said his father but go thou to the wise woman of brugeford and find if aught can free us from this monster to the wise woman went the child and asked her advice tis thy fault o child for which we suffer she said be it thine to release us i would give my life said the child mayhap thou wilt do so said she but hear me and mark me well thou and thou alone canst kill the worm but to this end go thou to the smithy and have thy armor studded with spearheads then go to the worm's rock in the wear and station thyself there then when the worm comes to the rock at dawn of day try thy prowess on him and god give thee a good deliverance this i will do said child lambden but one more thing said the wise woman going back to her cell if thou slay the worm swear that thou wilt put to death the first thing that meets thee as thou crossest again the threshold of lambton hall do this and all will be well with thee and thine fulfill not thou vow and none of the lamptons for generations three times three shall die in his bed swear and fail not the child swore as the wise woman bid and went his way to the smithy there he had his armor studded with spearheads all over then he passed his vigils in brugeford chapel and at dawn of day took his post on the worm's rock in the river where as dawn broke the worm uncoiled its snaky twine from around the hill and came to its rock in the river when it perceived the child waiting for it it lashed the waters in its fury and wound its coils round the child and then attempted to crush him to death but the more it pressed the deeper dug the spearheads into its sides still it pressed and pressed till all the water around was crimsoned with its blood then the worm unwound itself and left the child free to use his sword he raised it brought it down and cut the worm in two one half fell into the river and was carried swiftly away once more the head and the remainder of the body encircled the child but with less force and the spearheads did their work at last the worm uncoiled itself snorted its last foam of blood and fire and rolled dying into the river and was never seen more the child of lambton swam ashore and raising his bugle to his lips sounded its note thrice this was the signal to the hall where the servants and the old lord had shut themselves in to pray for the child's success when the third sound of the bugle was heard they were to release boris the child's favorite hound but such was their joy at learning of the child's safety and the worm's defeat that they forgot orders and when the child reached the threshold of the hall his old father rushed out to meet him and would have clasped him to his breast the vow the vow cried out the child of lambton and blew still another blast upon his horn this time the servants remembered and released boris who came bounding to his young master the child raised his shining sword and severed the head of his faithful hound but the vow was broken and for nine generations of men none of the lamptons died in his bed the last of the lamptons died in his carriage as he was crossing brugeford bridge one hundred and thirty years ago end of the lampton worm this recording has been by matt butcher from peoria illinois you can go to my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com and you can find my book narrations on Audible by searching matt.butcher. Section 43 of More English Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com org recording by ruhi huck more english fairy tales by joseph jacobs the wise men of gotham of buying of sheep there were two men of gotham and one of them was going to market to nottingham to buy sheep and the other came from the market and they both met together upon nottingham bridge 
where are you going said the one who came from nottingham marry said he that was going to nottingham i am going to buy sheep buy sheep said the other and which way will you bring them home marry said the other i will bring them over this bridge by robin hood said he that came from nottingham but thou shalt not by maid marian said he that was going thither but i will you will not said the one i will then they beat their staves against the ground one against the other as if there had been a hundred sheep between them hold in said one beware lest my sheep leap over the bridge i care not said the other but they shall not come this way but they shall said the other then the other said if that thou make much to do i will put my fingers in thy mouth will you said the other now as they were at their contention another man of gotham came from the market with a sack of meal upon a horse and seeing and hearing his neighbours at strife about sheep though there were none between them said ah fools will you ever learn wisdom help me and lay my sack upon my shoulders they did so and he went to the side of the bridge unloosened the mouth of the sack and shook all his meal out into the river now neighbours he said how much meal is there in my sack marry said they there is none at all now by my faith said he even as much wit as is in your two heads to stir up strife about a thing you have not which was the wisest of the three persons judge yourself of hedging a cuckoo once upon a time the wise men of gotham would have kept the cuckoo so that she might sing all the year and in the midst of their town they made a hedge round in compass and they got a cuckoo and put her into it and said sing there all through the year or thou shalt have neither meat nor water the cuckoo as soon as she perceived herself within the hedge flew away a vengeance on her said they we did not make our hedge high enough of sending cheeses there was a man of gotham who went to the market at nottingham to sell cheese and as he was going down the hill to nottingham bridge one of his cheeses fell out of his wallet and rolled down the hill ah gaffer said the fellow can you run to market alone i will send one after another after you then he laid down his wallet and took out the cheeses and rolled them down the hill some went into one bush and some went into another i will charge you all to meet me near the market-place and when the fellow came to the market to meet his cheeses he stayed there till the market was nearly done then he went about to inquire of his friends and neighbours and other men if they did see his cheeses come to the market who should bring them said one of the market men marry themselves said the fellow they know the way well enough he said a vengeance on them all i did fear to see them run so fast that they would run beyond the market i am now fully persuaded that they must be now almost at york whereupon he forthwith hired a horse to ride to york to seek his cheeses where they were not but to this day no man can tell him of his cheeses of drowning eels when good friday came the men of gotham cast their heads together what to do with their white herrings their red herrings their sprats and other salt fish one consulted with the other and agreed that such fish should be cast into their pond which was in the middle of the town that they might breed against the next year and every man that had salt fish left cast them into the pond i have many white herrings said one i have many sprats said another i have many red herrings said the other i have much salt fish let's all go into the pond or pool and we shall fare like lords next year at the beginning of next year following the men drew near the pond to have their fish and there was nothing but a great eel ah said they all a mischief on this eel for he has eaten up all our fish what shall we do to him said one to the others 
kill him said one chop him into pieces said another not so said another let us drown him be it so said all and they went to another pond and cast the eel into the pond lie there and shift for yourself for no help thou shalt have from us and they left the eel to drown of sending rent once on a time the men of gotham had forgotten to pay their landlord one said to the other to-morrow is our pay-day and what shall we find to send our money to our landlord the one said this day i have caught a hare and he shall carry it for he is light of foot be it so said all he shall have a letter and a purse to put our money in and we shall direct him the right way so when the letters were written and the money put in a purse they tied it round the hare's neck saying first you go to lancaster then thou must go to Lowborough, and newark is our landlord and commend us to him and there is his dues the hare as soon as he was out of their hands ran on along the country way some cried thou must go to lancaster first let the hare alone said another he can tell a nearer way than the rest of us all let him go another said it is a subtle hare let her alone she will not keep the highway for fear of dogs of counting on a certain time there were twelve men of gotham who went fishing and some went into the water and some on dry ground and as they were coming back one of them said we have ventured much this day wading i pray god that none of us that did come from home be drowned marry said one let us see about that twelve of us came out and every man did count eleven and the twelfth man did never count himself alas said one to another one of us is drowned they went back to the brook where they had been fishing and looked up and down for him that was drowned and made great lamentation a courtier came riding by and he did ask what they were seeking and why they were so sorrowful oh said they this day we came to fish in this brook and there were twelve of us and one is drowned why said the courtier count me how many of you there be and one counted eleven and did not count himself well said the courtier what will you give me if i find the twelfth man sir said they all the money we have give me the money said the courtier and he began with the first and gave him a whack over the shoulders that he groaned and said there is one and he served all of them that they groaned but when he came to the last he gave him a good blow saying here is the twelfth man god bless you on your heart said all the company you have found our neighbour end of the wise men of gotham Section forty four of More English Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen Costa. More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. Princess of Canterbury. There lived formerly in the county of Cumberland a nobleman who had three sons, two of whom were comely and clever youths, but the other a natural fool named Jack, who was generally engaged with the sheep. He was dressed in a party-coloured coat and a steeple-crowned hat with a tassel, as became his condition. Now the king of Canterbury had a beautiful daughter, who was distinguished by her great ingenuity and wit and he issued a decree that whoever should answer three questions put to him by the princess should have her in marriage and be heir to the crown at his decease shortly after this decree was published news of it reached the ears of the nobleman's sons and the two clever ones determined to have a trial but they were sadly at a loss to prevent their idiot brother from going with them they could not by any means get rid of him and were compelled at length to let jack accompany them 
They had not gone far before Jack shrieked with laughter, saying, I've found an egg! Put it in your pocket, said the brothers. A little while afterwards he burst out into another fit of laughter on finding a crooked hazel stick, which he also put in his pocket, and a third time he again laughed extravagantly because he found a nut. That also was put with his other treasures. When they arrived at the palace they were immediately admitted on mentioning the nature of their business, and were ushered into a room where the princess and her suite were sitting. Jack, who never stood on ceremony, bawled out, "'What a troop of fair ladies we've got here!' "'Yes,' said the princess, "'we are fair ladies, for we carry fire in our bosoms.' "'Do you?' said Jack. "'Then roast me an egg,' pulling out the egg from his pocket. "'How will you get it out again?' said the princess. "'With a crooked stick,' replied Jack, producing the hazel. "'Where did that come from?' said the princess. "'From a nut,' answered Jack, pulling out the nut from his pocket. "'I've answered the three questions, and now I'll have the lady.' "'No, no,' said the king. "'Not so fast. You have still an ordeal to go through. You must come here in a week's time and watch for one whole night with the princess, my daughter. If you can manage to keep awake the whole night long, you shall marry her the next day.' "'But if I can't?' said Jack. Then off goes your head, said the king. But you need not try unless you like. Well, Jack went back home for a week, and thought over whether he should try and win the princess. At last he made up his mind. Well, said Jack, I'll try my Vorton Zonau for the king's daughter, or a headless shepherd. And taking his bottle and bag, he trudged to the court. In his way thither he was obliged to cross a river, and pulling off his shoes and stockings. While he was passing over, he observed several pretty fish bobbing against his feet. So he caught some and put them into his pocket. When he reached the palace he knocked at the gate loudly with his crook, and having mentioned the object of his visit, he was immediately conducted to the hall where the king's daughter sat ready, prepared to see her lovers. He was placed in a luxurious chair, and rich wines and spices were set before him, and all sorts of delicate meats. Jack, unused to such fare, ate and drank plentifully, so that he was nearly dozing before midnight. "'Oh, shepherd,' said the lady, "'I have caught you napping.' "'No, sweet ally, I was busy a-fishing.' "'A fishing,' said the princess, in the utmost astonishment. "'Nay, shepherd, there is no fish-pond in the hall.' "'No matter for that. I have been fishing in my pocket, and have just caught one.' "'Oh, me!' said she. "'Let me see it.' The shepherd slyly drew the fish out of his pocket, and, pretending to have caught it, showed it to her, and she declared it was the finest she ever saw. About half an hour afterwards she said, "'Shepherd, do you think you could get me one more?' He replied, "'Mayhap I may.' when I have baited my hook. And after a little while he brought out another, which was finer than the first, and the princess was so delighted that she gave him leave to go to sleep, and promised to excuse him to her father. In the morning the princess told the king, to his great astonishment, that Jack must not be beheaded, for he had been fishing in the hall all night. But when he heard how Jack had caught such beautiful fish out of his pocket, he asked him to catch one in his own. Jack readily undertook the task, and bidding the king lie down, he pretended to fish in his pocket, having another fish concealed ready in his hand. And giving him a sly prick with a needle, he held up the fish and showed it to the king. His majesty did not much relish the operation, but he assented to the marvel of it and the princess and Jack were united the same day, and lived for many years in happiness and prosperity. End of Princess of Canterbury Recording by Kathleen Costa This is the end of More English Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs